Today's video is sponsored by Wondery. Follow Wondery's The Vanished on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Today's video is also sponsored by Established Titles, and they're running a massive holiday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code SCARED, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com forward slash scared to get your gifts now. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois, on a short dead end street 10 plus miles from a town. And there were seven houses in the area spread out on two and a half acres of wooded lots or larger even. There were no large wild animals, there aren't bears or similar large animals in the region. And people didn't meander there or show up lost or anything like that. Actually, lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years that I lived there. So please keep that in mind as I tell my story. So when I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was, and he would sometimes tromp over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from gravel area outside at my window just to chat. My bed was right next to the window and I would open the window and we'd sort of whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard and his house was to the side of it. I could see his house from my window in fact over the shrub trees and walking path to his driveway. I would often know if he was out too. The light was on over the side door entrance or if he was already home the light would always be off. At one time during the summer when my window was open I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old and it was around midnight. I heard Terry get out of the car and was talking to his friends. Soon his friends pulled away and I softly called out, as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond though as he probably didn't hear me and then I came up with the not so brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. I'd spent many years in the woods and learning how to blend in and be silent as kids, we would often sneak around and scare each other. So I silently sneaked out from the second floor and out of my back garage door which led to our backyard below my window, which also led to Terry's house off the side, through our gravel area, then through a well-worn path through the woods about maybe 25 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house, probably because nothing much grew to the shade of the oak trees, there were 14 inch oak rounds set out as an uneven stepping path in the gravel and if you stepped off onto the rounds the crunch of the gravel rocks would give you away. But I picked up my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark and I didn't see him. Also at that time I heard the door of his house close and the light going off signaling that he went in, likely to bed. I waited a bit as I thought that I saw something move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path that we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild roses and raspberry plants that had thorns and were painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So I thought that it was odd that he'd be in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him or something. But I saw something human size and dark moving through the woods slowly and pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer and I definitely saw it but it was strange in that it wasn't walking directly to my window to talk. Therefore I hunched down and waited in silence wondering if I could still startle him. I still thought that it was Terry and he saw me and snuck out and he was trying to scare me. I watched a dark outline of a human figure moving but then I would lose sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening or checking every few feet while hiding. So I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry, but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching, so I quietly tiptoed back to my garage door and went back inside, silently looking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing or crouching. My window was open and 
I definitely heard someone or something walking around the yard. I whispered again for Terry out of my window, but got no answer. Then I heard someone or something fall and grunt or moan pretty loudly in the window well, right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents, but definitely loud enough that I didn't mistake it. and It sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with a window well, it's a semicircle hole connected to the house, dug out about three or four feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level and the hole lets some natural light in. But there was no way Terry would have fallen into our window well. But we had been playing hide and seek and many outdoor games for years since we were young around the whole neighborhood. We knew everybody's window wells and house footprints plus paths in the woods, like the back of our hands. And the grunt sounded human-ish and not like an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. It was around this time, too, that that was when I realized that this wasn't a fun game and somebody or something was out there and it wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best as I could, but there was a screen on my windows to keep the bugs out, so... I couldn't lean my head out the window to see next to the wall of our house directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks or, or whatever as it was stepping in this noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log rounds were and would not step in the gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict and he was as good at being quiet as I was. Whatever it was though, it stopped and I held my breath. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for probably half an hour. It seemed like an hour, but I'm sure that I didn't have patience back then to wait that long. But I never heard it, him or her, leave, but I grew tired and eventually I just fell asleep on my bed that was next to the window. Now, there are a few things that I'm certain of. One, it was not Terry. I asked him later too, and... He said that he went to bed that night when he got home. He also would have no reason to lie, so it just makes no sense for it to be Terry. I'm pretty sure that it wasn't one of our neighbors too, and I can't think of any reason that a person would be there. We had a few neighbors and only two other houses out of seven had kids. Again too, these seven houses were spread out in two and a half plus acres per home. There weren't any big animals in the area too, like I said. And as wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer, but they were hunted and didn't come close to homes ever. Plus, our dog scared them away all the time, so that just doesn't make any sense. And all I can put it down to is that that night, I was out there in the woods with a stranger who apparently followed me all the way back to my own home. It's hard to imagine losing a loved one, a wife, a husband, a child. For many, it is their biggest fear. From Wondery, The Vanished is a podcast that tells the stories of often overlooked and unsolved missing persons cases. Every week, host Marissa Jones dives into a new case, sharing the details of their mysterious disappearances from interviews with family, friends, law enforcement, and even suspects in an effort to reveal the truth. The Vanished has even aided in getting long overdue arrests through their in-depth interviews. Marissa reminds listeners of the human behind the headline and aims to help family members find their vanished loved one, or at least a sense of peace. If you're anything like me and you love these sorts of investigative media formats, then this is something you won't want to miss. Marissa does a seriously great job of capturing the details as well as the subtle ambience of each case. I've been listening to the accounts of the people involved in the cases, and I just got finished listening to the Jared Green case. I was hooked from start to finish, and really appreciated just how much time was given to the family members and people associated with the case to share their experiences in their own words. Follow The Vanished on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. A few years ago, I was working at a pizza chain in my hometown as a driver. I was 27, but made some pretty good money delivering, let me tell you. 
I had worked at a few other places, both local and chain in the years before, and still work as a dasher on occasion, even after this happened. But now I choose to deliver in much safer areas for this reason. I got luckier than I could have ever imagined. So one night, I was working and had a double, two deliveries to take. Both were cash orders. I had $12 left in my bank. What drivers are given to use as change for cash orders, so you don't have a ton of cash on you at all times. The first order, it went smoothly. The guy gave me 50 for a $35 order, so I was excited about the nice tip. I drove to the second delivery. It was at an apartment complex with multiple buildings. I had delivered there before. The sun was about to set, but it was still pretty light out. The chain that I worked at had us drive company cars with the logo on it, all white sedans, and this is important. I grab the order and I go to the door to the apartment building. A young guy comes out and a much bigger older guy was outside smoking a cigarette. The big guy went inside as the smaller guy came out. He looked around sort of nervously and asked how much he owed me. The way he was looking around though just made me very nervous all of a sudden. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I told him the amount and he said that that wasn't what he was told on the phone. Something was wrong and it was then when I felt someone else walk out behind me from the door as the first young guy looked around down the parking lot craning his neck as if he was looking for someone. I told him the amount again and broke down the order for him trying to keep calm. And then, all of a sudden, the first guy held a gun right to my temple. I also felt a poke on my spine, because there were two gunmen. I couldn't speak. Words wouldn't form no matter how hard I tried. Give me your money and your keys now, the first guy growled, and I fumbled immediately for the keys. I gave him everything, but hadn't realized the 50 was mixed in, and I gave him the keys trying my best to remain calm. Another guy came up from my left... He had sort of uh, poofy hair and was around the same age as the first kid. The one behind me I hadn't seen yet. The big hair kid grabbed the pizza bag and ran off and hid. The first kid searched the company car. Luckily I'd left my wallet in my personal car. I saw him grab my cell phone though and that's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on that phone that I hadn't backed up of my five-year-old son who absolutely is my world. So I said, please, please don't take that. I have pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him, please. I lied. My son is very much alive. The kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, just listen to him. You'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell that he'd been crying by how his voice sounded. A car began pulling up and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in a full sprint. Before the one behind me ran, he dropped the gun in front of me, standard issue 9mm silver and black and safety off, looked completely real to me. He picked it back up and ran with the others. The car that pulled in saw me. It was a woman and her kid. Panic set in as I realized that they could possibly come back and do way worse to me as the sky started to get dark, but I collapsed. They had taken my company car keys, $72, the pizza, and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked if I was alright. She took me into her apartment in the next building over and we locked the door. I was shaking so hard I couldn't even hold her phone to talk to the 911 operator as she set down her kid. Her boyfriend, I assumed, helped me call. I spoke to the operator and told her everything. I'm actually colorblind and... These guys were obviously wearing all black and white clothes, thank God. I had a full description of the two of them though, and the poor woman who helped me was going to be late for work, but she still stayed until I was off the phone and the cops had shown up. And man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator, let me tell you, but I will never forget this woman's utter kindness to me and her boyfriend's as well. The cops showed up though and contacted my store and my manager brought out the spare keys for me to drive the car back to the store. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by crying and beyond worried co-workers. All of them were terrified that I was hurt. It meant a lot to me how much they cared, but I told them that I was alright. I filed the proper paperwork and the 72 was written off as a loss to the store. Thank God, because I had worked other stores that made you pay back the money out of pocket if you got robbed to prevent drivers from stealing. 
I was told by the owner to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself. He gave me a hug, and he was, to this day, one of the best bosses I've ever had. What I didn't know, though, was I was in for a very long night. I called my best friend before I left the store from the store phone and asked where he was. But we usually met up for drinks after work. He was around the corner at a bar, so I met up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, the same district that this happened in. He told me that his dad had given him a heads up and he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. After the two shots, we began playing pool when his dad called his phone and asked if I was with him yet. He said yeah and handed me the phone. His dad asked if I could come to the station. I was honest and told him that I had had two shots, so he sent out a squad car to get me since it wasn't that far away. We get to the station and they actually had the suspects in custody and I was needed to ID them. There were three boys and a driver and they had been caught less than 20 minutes after the robbery, speeding. The BOLO had already gone out and they matched the description. They had used the money to buy weed and gas and they had taken off. They had at least 15 stolen cell phones on them. The order had been placed on a stolen phone and my phone was in the mix with the box. The police told me to grab my phone only and I did. They asked me to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification so that was easy. Nine of the ten tries to unlock it had already been used before my phone would have completely reset. And, in, and it unlocked. I told the police every detail yet again. Although my parental instincts kicked in, I told them the guy behind me quite obviously was bullied into this and to show mercy. He was the one with the white t-shirt. The police went wide-eyed and told me that he was the one talking. The other three denied involvement, and that's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. He found out later that he was completely unaware of the robbery and was just picking up his friends. He was never charged. The boy who was behind me though and the one who grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and got six months of house arrest. The only reason the one behind me got off easy, despite having the gun to my back, was because I asked them to go easy on him and that he was a good kid who just didn't want to be there. He was also the only one confessing and it makes sense since he had even said the other guy wouldn't have the phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops had they not been caught but the other guy, the first kid who put the gun to my temple, it was his 18th birthday and he got the book thrown at him. In the courtroom he actually made fun of me as well and was laughing at me. Seeing him made me panic a bit. The judge scolded him for his behavior and he just grinned and glared at me with a joker-like smile. All I could see was pure evil. This kid, I'm sure of it, will commit way more crimes. I have no doubt that he's eventually going to end someone's life, in fact, and you could just see how cold he was just by looking in his eyes. I grew up in a town full of murderers and abusers, and I had never seen this kind of evil in my life before. Quite honestly, too... I don't ever want to see it again. I asked to have my name stricken from the records and I asked to remain anonymous in case he ever got out and I'm so glad that I did that because today I got a letter from the state. He's being released in February. The court only had my old address at my parents' house and my mum didn't think the letter was important. I missed the deadline to protest his release for probation. The plea deal was eight years and... It's only been four. Also, he's getting out early due to overcrowding. Not good behavior, but overcrowding. This coming February, and I'm ready if he finds me. My wife, my parents, everyone I know, knows his face and name. And if he tries anything, we're all ready. And for his sake, I really hope that we don't ever meet again. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So, have you ever struggled to find a unique and a thoughtful gift with a bit of a personal twist? Well, you're certainly not alone. Every year I seem to struggle to find something that I can give to people that I love that I can be proud of. Thankfully, this year I'm not going to have that problem whatsoever, because I'll be making some of my friends and family members lords and ladies. Let me explain. Established Titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland, as well as support global reforestation efforts. 
through established titles, you can purchase a souvenir plot of land in Scotland, and based on historic Scottish customs, this allows you to call yourself a lord or a lady. I purchased one for myself too, and I fully intend to pull out my lord card when I need it. After all, lords don't take out trash or do yard work, right? Title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land with a unique plot number on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, and an official certificate with a crest. They plant a tree with every order and work with global charities, One Tree Planted, and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. You could officially include the title Lord or Lady on your credit card, plane tickets, dating profiles, whatever you think, and it makes a great last minute gift. Also, the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot, within a few minutes of walking distance. And depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our little bee scared or bee buster kingdom where we all refuse to take out trash and do yard work. So, if you're doing some last minute holiday shopping, this is the perfect gift. You can order a digital certificate and print it out all within 5 minutes. Established Titles is running a massive holiday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code SCARED, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com forward slash SCARED to get your gifts now and help support the channel. That's establishedtitles.com forward slash SCARED to get your gifts now and help support the channel. This all started back in 2014 at a youth hostel in Utah. I woke up screaming in a dorm room after opening my eyes to a mouthless black-eyed young girl sitting on my chest and staring me in the face inches away from me. From there, and as my alcoholism got worse and spiritual energy levels became corroded and more dark, that's the best way that I can put it, it started happening a lot more. It came in different forms. Faceless demons, old ladies, grim reaper, etc, etc. But always the same thing. Terrifying and even painful. By painful I mean I would be choked. My left side of my throat seems to feel the most pain. Also I would get electrocuted or what feels like electrocution anyway. Strangely too, many times I can sense when it will happen. I can almost feel this overwhelmed feeling of dread and fear, like some sinister evil envelops me and fills the room, just waiting for me to drift off ever so slightly so that it can attack and begin to choke me. I hear terrible things whispered into my ear, how horrible I am as a person, mocking me relentlessly to the point where I would break down in tears. One instance of that was in the form of two witches who would talk smack about me, like soul-crushing stuff that... I don't know why I was so affected by, but each time I would slip into a hypnagogic state, I would tap into their conversation about me. Between that and the choking or sort of electrocution thing, it makes you not want to sleep at all. The scariest part of all this is one sleep paralysis incident when I woke up screaming after the usual strangulation and hateful rhetoric from the death wraith grim reaper looking thing and... I woke up near tears from fear and sadness, and shock even. I told my wife about it finally for the first time. Usually I would just keep it in because even after these intense episodes, you know people just don't get it, so I kept it to myself. But anyways, my wife told me that I actually had a handprint or choke marks on my throat, and when I went to the mirror, sure enough, I did. It actually looked like a humanoid red handprint, and it wasn't subtle. It was like someone had grabbed my throat and strangled me, and you could see it. Recently, I've been having this happen more and more too, but without the humanoid entities. Just the presence and the sensation, I guess. Last night, I had these tentacle jellyfish looking things that seemed to be extracting energy or something from me, and it was painful. In my worst encounters, it feels like my soul is literally being ripped from my body, but since I've gotten sober and life is a whole lot more mellow and generally positive, it's gotten less intense, but I still feel it, and honestly, it's really messing up my quality of life. I miss dreaming good dreams. I can't remember the last good dream that I've had, and if I do have one, it's always infiltrated or hijacked by this messed up entity. But whether it be real or psychological, it doesn't matter. It's affecting me. 
It happens during periods of light awakeness too, where I can still see my room and surroundings, and light hypnagogic states, but also in dreams too, where the entity seems to hack into the dream characters like Agent Smith in the Matrix, and they suddenly take this malevolent, hateful energy and the rest of my dream, they're just trying to murder me. I hate suffering from this stuff. It's terrifying and it just won't stop being terrifying. But it's grown to the point where I'm just annoyed by it now. If I am being haunted by something, it's definitely earned my mutual contempt and I want to learn how to fight back and even kill this thing. So if you can help me with this, I would be really grateful. Back in university days, I lived in a small three-bedroom apartment with two other roommates. My apartment was on the topmost floor of the building and also the last room on the floor, corner room. It was numbered 707. Our only neighbor is 706, which has been vacant for a while. So our side of the building is very quiet and sparse of people in general. There are three bedrooms which are adjourned in an upside down sort of L shape. One room in the middle, one room to the left of it, and another room below it. For ease of storytelling, I'll call it the middle room, bottom room, and left room. My own room is the bottom room. Also, to be noted, these are Japanese rooms or buildings, so a wooden flooring, sliding doors, sliding closet inside the room, thin wood panel wall between rooms, all that jazz. The left room and the middle room both had heavy sliding doors as well. Between the middle room and my bottom room, there was a hollow space that is pretty large, a closet with sliding doors as well. It's the closet where you fold and store futons and such, and if you've ever watched Doraemon, then that's the same closet that he sleeps in. Anyway, the story happened on a summer vacation. The owner of the middle room had been away for a few days and won't be back until new semester started. One night, me and the left room owner were chilling in each of our rooms. Left room owner, we'll call her Lefty, she was supposed to leave for summer vacation in a week and has been packing. I kept hearing loud thuds and sounds of something heavy hitting the wall or the floor, but I ignored it because I assumed that she was still packing. About 11 o'clock at night, Lefty texted me, Yumi, are you okay? Are you sick? I was really confused. Lefty continued, I kept hearing someone sneezing and coughing. Isn't that you? I said, No, I've been quiet this entire time. Isn't it you who's been moving around and packing boxes? Lefty said, What? I haven't been packing anything at all today. I've been on my bed playing with my phone the entire time. Immediately, I put down my headset and laptop and just sort of sat straight on my bed, looking at the text on my phone, feeling somewhat disturbed. About five minutes later, Lefty came to my room and we both sat together confirming with each other what we heard. She heard someone sniffling and sneezing, but I heard thuds and the sound of something on the floor, like the sound of boxes or something pushed against the floor. We sat in silence in my room and the sound came again. There was a thud and knocks. We looked at each other. We figured it out. She thought the sound came from me, and I thought that it came from her. In between our two rooms, the common space is the unoccupied middle room. There was knocking, thuds, sounds of boxes moving, and there were the sound of footsteps for sure. It sounds like a very active person inside the room pretty much the entire night. Neither one of us wanted to go and check it out, so we tried to ignore it and just slept it through. Fast forward to the morning... Lefty is an early riser, while I don't wake up until 9 or 10, typically. My bed is on the right side of the door, but I sleep facing the door. I just woke up, and I heard a loud thud and footsteps from outside my room, like someone was running, and I saw a short shadow passing through the cracks of my slightly open door. It took my sleepy brain a little while to process this. Running footstep sounds are pretty common because my room is beside the front door, so every school day my roommates would make this commotion outside of my door anyway when they're going out of the house. However, the first thing that I finally noticed was that it was summer vacation, so who would be running in a rush like this on the hallway? 
The second thing too is that that shadow looked too short to be my roommate. It was the height of a child if anything. The third, I can see the shadow through the cracks of my slightly open door. So who opened my door? I don't sleep with my door opened. Feeling scared, I immediately texted Lefty and asked her where she was. She said that she had left the house since 7.30 in the morning because it's Sunday and church and all that, and currently she's about to get lunch. She didn't open my door. She didn't touch my room, in fact. It was closed when she left, apparently. I immediately got up and ran out of the house to meet Lefty and told her about it this morning. We decided to drag another friend and ask him to help us check our apartment to see if there's anything or someone in there. The three of us walked into the apartment and towards the middle room. We noticed something weird though. The door was slightly opened. It was a sliding door and quite heavy so there was no way that it could open by itself. We confirmed that neither me nor Lefty had touched that door since the owner left last week. It was always closed. Our friend opened the door and we immediately felt chills. He asked where did we hear the sound coming from and I said from my room it sounds like it came very close, right on the wall connected between my bottom room and the middle room. That's when we realized too that the wall connected between my room and this middle room where we heard all of this activity, it was inside the closet. My parents would have never allowed for a real Ouija board in the house when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s. Sex, drugs and violence were fine as entertainment, but my seemingly unreligious parents had this weird distance between anything occult or what they would call satanic. And yes, that's exactly how they said the word too. So, maybe 14, mid-90s hanging out with my band who were just two guys that didn't know how to play instruments like me and we just hung out and daydreamed about being rock stars and all that. Think sort of wild stallions from Bill and Ted sort of thing. We got on the subject of witchcraft and Ouija boards came up and I had the idea to make one after hearing from the goth chick on the bus that they could be more powerful that way. So I got a rectangle cardboard piece and made the most crude Ouija board that I could from memory. The other guys had only seen them in stores like me, so we just kind of put things on as we remembered them. So we made a little planchette out of some thicker cardboard and got to seancing. We asked the standard, are you there sort of questions. The planchette moved and we got answers that made no sense. Seemingly random letters and a few numbers that didn't form words or anything meaningful, I guess. We all assumed that one of us was sabotaging the whole thing. But then I asked if there was anything that we could do to help us understand. With zero hesitation, the planchette darted to the moon and then just as quickly over to the sun image. It felt like we all almost lost our place on the planchette because it was definitely moving on its own at this point. And then it slowly spelled out D-E-S-R-E-V-E-R -E -E before making three quick circles around the center of the cardboard, sort of counterclockwise and darting to goodbye. We all kind of sat there with our mouths open for a minute. Bass player said, I only remembered to write down the last letters that it gave us. What does desrever mean? Me being a first year French language student thought that it was de revere and I confidently assumed that it meant the rivers, but I knew that I had no clue. But then the keyboard player says, guys, it says reversed. As in, it was spelt backwards, but the word was reversed. We left to see for ourselves if we had the sun and the moon reversed, and we walked downtown to the nearest apartment store. And sure enough, the one that we made was almost perfect to the one in the store, that is, except for the one major detail. The sun and the moon were indeed incorrectly placed on my homemade Ouija board. We ran home promptly and... After that, we burnt it in the fireplace, and never again. I live in Melbourne, Australia, and there used to be a mental asylum called Laurendell, built in 1938, but eventually closed down in 1999. 
I was told about this place and how haunted it was with people hearing creepy things. I was keen to check it out myself, and more than ten years later I still can't explain what happened in those three or so minutes that we were there. So, it was 2011. One night we drummed up this stupid idea because we were bored and had nothing to do. So me and three mates decided to go and check out Laurendale because, I mean, why not? The asylum at the time we went was being prepared to be demolished or renovated for new apartments. So most of the entrances and the windows were boarded up with wood. The building we parked next to was surrounded by a metal makeshift fence to keep people or squatters out I guess. And had a security patrolling the grounds. One of my friends was strong enough to lift the metal fence that wasn't properly attached which allowed us to crawl under and get inside the property grounds. It was all fun and games. We were having a good time. The feeling of doing something that you're not allowed to and trying not to get caught. You know the feeling, right? Anyway, but we were constantly on the lookout for the security officer patrolling but also trying to look for a doorway inside. When we finally found one, but we one by one walked inside. Scared, mind you, we all put our torches on our phones on and shined the light inside so that we could see. When we walked in the door, it's a sort of small entrance area that leads into a main room. We walked a little closer to the main room to get a better look. There were no windows that we could see, just a, a simple room. This all happened in like 30 seconds, so we didn't get a proper look, but... In front of us on the left was a staircase. I think it was leading up to other rooms and stuff, and all the walls were covered in graffiti. We didn't see anything paranormal. It was scary enough just being there, to be honest. It had only been 10-15 seconds of us standing there when we suddenly heard footsteps approaching. The crunching sound of gravel grew closer and closer from behind us outside. We immediately shut off our torches and were left standing there huddled together in the darkness. We couldn't see anything. In fact, I might as well have had my eyes closed, but they were wide open expecting someone or something to grab me. But we had our backs to the door behind us waiting for the footsteps to hopefully walk by us, thinking that the security guard must have seen us. As the crunching of the gravel was fast approaching us, we all instinctively held each other's hand waiting for the security to bust us. We stopped breathing as the footsteps came to a halt behind us. The sound was unmistakable. The crunching of the gravel stopped and we just stood there. That silence was deafening. The darkness swallowing us. None of us were turning around. It felt like an eternity but we stood there for about 10 seconds waiting for something, anything. A sound or someone to say something behind us or a torch to shine in on us from outside. But nothing. In fact, it wasn't until one of my friends turned around slowly and there was nothing or nobody there. He finally broke the silence and said, let's get out of here and we bolted out of the door and back to our car. Neither of us saw the security as we raced out of the door as well. We got in the car and left and after that we never went back. Still, 10 plus years later, I think about those footsteps and how no one was there when we turned around. We never heard the footsteps receding too as we stood there in the silent darkness. Even if it was a weird prank and someone was there too, we would have heard the footsteps running away. It was also eerily quiet, so quiet that you could have heard a pin drop. It just stopped directly behind us and it's something that I'll never be able to explain. And we all remember it exactly the same way too. I wrestled with the memory for a while thinking that I was just misremembering it. But after checking with my mates again after so long, we heard those footsteps behind us. There was no doubt about it. Chalking it down to a scary unexplainable moment that could have gone very differently if we stayed to investigate. The whole experience was eerie and really unsettling from the moment that we shut our torches off and were left standing there in complete darkness. The very first time I saw these things, I was around six or seven years old. My family was camping in some lake in Oklahoma and I saw, I saw two strange figures. 
I was standing outside our camper, alone, and I saw a ghostly white figure. It looked like a preteen girl with long hair and a gown, running into the woods, chased by a, a tall, thin black figure. I froze and called for my dad, who went into the woods where I saw these things, but he saw no footprints or anything. So, I moved into a rural property in 2015, and it was my home. In January of 2016, aged 11, I was standing outside and just kind of staring out of the trees on the property. For a solid three seconds, though, I made eye contact with this abnormally tall, emaciated, pitch-black humanoid. I use quotations around eye contact, seeing as it had no eyes. It was just hanging upside down by its knees from a tree branch. Its long arms were touching the ground. If I had to guess, I'd say it was around 7 to 10 feet tall. But I felt a deep sense of dread and I ran inside to tell my dad. When he came back out a few seconds later, it was gone. I hadn't started seeing them again as well until just recently, starting in September. On September 28th, my boyfriend, brother and I were down from the road from my house trying to catch fish at a bridge. I got bored and a bit uncomfy because there were gnats, so I started walking up the road back to my house. I was about halfway there when I saw the figure standing in the center of the road. I froze, it froze, and we stood there for about maybe a minute or two. It was around nine feet tall and its hands nearly touched the ground. I ran back to the bridge and I waited to walk back home with my brother and my boyfriend. I didn't speak for a solid two hours after that as well. Two days ago as well, I was closing the blinds to a window that my cat enjoys perching at. And one of them was straight outside of the window. It had its face inches from the glass. It seemed to sort of open its mouth. I don't know why this one had a mouth, but in its mouth was a huge bulging eye. I freaked out and curled up in my bed and I didn't sleep that night. And today I saw it peeking around a corner in my living room. I don't know what to do and I'm absolutely terrified. Does anyone know anything about this and is there anything that I can do about it? I live in Pennsylvania and there's this creepy house called Ray Myers Hollow where a murder took place in 1928. On one afternoon, I was hanging out with two of my friends, and we were really not doing anything. This was like four years ago, and we were just bored teenagers. So, I mentioned checking out that house, and they never heard about it, so once they heard the backstory about it, they were down to visit it. When we got there, it was pretty light out. It was about maybe an hour away from us. We looked around, and imagining where everything took place, and just talking about the history of it and all that... If you're from Pennsylvania, then you'll probably know this place. You know that they upped the security over the years there, so we were being respectful and just sort of admiring the property. Once we decided to leave, my friend backed out and we went the wrong way. He ended up coming to a dead end and had to back up into someone's driveway. I was in the back seat, had my head looking at the back window to make sure that he was all good, when out of nowhere... There was this woman there, long black hair, piercing black eyes, and a white dress, staring at me and keeping eye contact in the doorway of this house. I turned around, freaked out. With tears in my eyes, I looked back, and when I did, there was nobody there. Now, I had to have only looked away for possibly two seconds at most. My friend who was backing up told me that he didn't see anything. My other friend was looking down at his phone, so clearly he didn't see anything. But somehow, I was the only one who witnessed her. I've never felt fear like that before too. The way that she was looking at me, it will never leave my mind. I don't know if I just saw a creepy woman squatting there or if I saw something paranormal, but whoever or whatever it was, it gave me a fright that... I'll never forget. So 
So I bought a Ouija board at a garage sale decades ago because I always liked the design of the board. I did try it once with a friend and a girlfriend, but nothing really happened. Very, very slight movement, possibly, was all, really. But no messages, and so I left the board out as decoration, but never really used it again. But I did try it again with just the girlfriend one time later, and it actually worked. It took a while to get going, but once it did, we were shocked at how quickly and deliberately it seemed to move, and... We kept asking each other, are you sure you're not pushing it? We apparently talked with more than one individual that night, including a mischievous one called Eight that showed up more than once. We would be talking with someone, then the answers would become sort of nonsensical and we would ask, who is this? And it would confess Eight. After an hour, the pointer or device was moving around really fluidly and but we were both laughing and amazed and constantly accusing the other person of moving it. I know that I was barely touching it and honestly it looked like she was too. I'm sure that I would have felt it if she were pushing it at the speed that it was going as well. It was more like we were trying to keep up with it I guess but I have a sense of how the trick might work based on little jitters from tired arms but this was moving around far too fast for that I thought at least. What I'm getting at is that it was really weird and I don't think that I can explain it. At one point though, we got in touch with someone claiming to be Mary, who knew my girlfriend. My girlfriend couldn't figure it out, but then she remembered a girl back in high school by that name and asked if it was her. In response, the device went over the we in the Ouija board, a brand name at the top. And then my girlfriend remembered that she had known a girl named Mary from French class who had apparently died and we is obviously French for yes. And that was one of those really goosebumpy moments. We asked Mary some things about where she is now and what it's like there. And then while we were thinking of what to ask next, the device started moving and spelled out, who's he? Super freaky, but also made sense since I had not gone to school with them. So we said, oh, this is, and gave them my name, and then it spelled out hi. But we kept asking questions and getting responses, and then at one point I made a joke, wondering how it all works. I suggested that maybe there are Ouija boards positioned around heaven, like customer service phones at the airport, and they announce it over the PA system when you have an incoming call. While my girlfriend and I are giggling at my dumb joke, the device moves very quickly over to no, then does two very fast loops around the board, and on the third one flies right off the board and into the wall across the living room. Yes, this really happened, and we were both stunned and both certain that we hadn't done that, and pretty sure that the other person had. But we both insisted that we were just as surprised and scared as the other. To this day, it remains a pretty inexplicable experience. Not just the ending, but all of it too. I don't really have an explanation for the speed at which that thing moved around the board, or how it flew so far with such a, a short runway, with our fingers barely touching it. To this day, I'm really not sure what to make of the experience. I will say though that I left the board on display, but... After that, I dumped the planchette and I never used it again. So I've never really told anyone about any of this because, well, I don't believe in the paranormal. I always thought that it was just rubbish, made up stuff and honestly, I still don't believe in it, but since this event, I still don't understand if it was real or if my mind projected something weird for a few minutes. This situation happened four years ago. It was January and I was alone in my apartment in the summer, but my parents would come for a visit in a few hours. It was too hot and almost night and I had the great idea of taking a cold shower. Since there was nobody home, I didn't close the door of the bathroom, but the shower glass door was closed all the time. And while I was taking a shower, I saw something walking in front of me outside the bathroom and this thing went to the left and to the right four times. 
The first time I thought that it just could have been my imagination, but the second time the figure passed through the bathroom. I turned off the shower and yelled, anybody here? I thought it was my parents, but nobody answered. The figure made the same trajectory, right, left, right, left. The fourth time the figure stopped outside the bathroom and it sort of seemed like it was looking at me for 10 to 15 seconds. Then the figure went to the left and I opened the door. I yelled again, but nobody answered. I got out of the bathroom and walked to each part of the apartment and nobody was home. Only me. So, the wife and I live in a pretty decent area. Nicely cared for homes, trimmed yards, fairly friendly neighbours for the most part. However, we're just a couple of houses off a main street where there are a number of duplexes. We rent in a converted home from the early 1900s that's a duplex too, so no shade on that. But some of which seem to partake in, uh, let's just say, illegal activities. Strangers parking on our street for five minutes to an hour, sometimes leaving someone in the vehicle, sometimes parked for days at a time. Anyway, I know the signs. There's also a fairly large homeless encampment within half a mile, so we get the occasional colourful character roaming through looking for recycling, something not nailed down or open car doors. You get the idea, but I digress. So one Friday night around 10pm, there's a knock on our door. No one visits us without a heads up or an invitation, especially that late, but I thought maybe one of our neighbours needed something. Now, I'm a bit paranoid, I'll admit. Security conscious? Yeah, so I never just go and open the door. During the day, I would look out of a side window before looking through the glass at the top of the door. But due to the hour, it's dark out, so... The side window isn't really an option. Also due to the hour, even if it is a neighbour, my security mind itself says that this is all wrong, so I grab my handy dandy, I'll let your imagination fill in the blank here, I walk over to the door and flip on the porch light. I have to stand on my tiptoes to see out the little block windows at the top of the door, and there's a guy there staring at me, about my height, six foot, scruffy facial hair, shaved head, looking a little ticked off and maybe a bit speedy as well. The stranger says I'm looking for and sort of garbles. I say, sorry, who? He says, Kevin. There's no Kevin here, man, I say. He said that he'd be here, though. He should be here, the guy says. You got the wrong address or you got fished, man. Can I use your phone? Uh, no, sorry. Good luck. I just stared at him until he turned around and walked down the steps. Then I turned off the porch light and went over to the blinds to watch him wander down the street. I don't know if the guy was legitimately lost or looking for some fool to just open their door, but I don't take chances. Even during the day, unless I ordered something that I know I need to sign for and you can't properly identify yourself... You can leave it on the porch and I'll get to it when I get to it. The door stays closed. Trying to kick it in? Good luck because I've bolted that sucker and the odds will not be in your favor. Again though, I don't know if the guy was legitimately lost or if he was just looking for somebody to open their door to do who knows what. Something tells me though that he wasn't lost. So when I was a kid, I was walking through the woods with a friend one day. Keep in mind too that this was before everyone had cell phones. We were looking for good wood to build a hut or something I think, but after looking around we spotted a white rope around a tree. As kids we were scared and sort of slowly approached the tree because we didn't know what it was. And then we spotted a leg with no pants on. We sort of edged our way around the tree and we could see a, a fully undressed man with a, a sack over his head and he didn't seem to move. At that, we ran to a busy bike path 200 meters further 
running and asking people to stop and listen. One older guy wanted to help, but his wife was like, no, it's a joke, and they walked away. So both still scared for this guy, as maybe he needed help or something, we went back. And yeah, he was just still sitting there. We approach slowly. He hasn't seen us because we approach from the back. When all of a sudden, he moves. In fact, he just stood up, removed the ropes, and we stayed hidden and looked on in silence. The man removed the mask, dropped it on the ground, and walked away to another part. Bear in mind, he's totally naked, walking like nothing happened. We followed him for some distance. He never looked around or said anything. We also kept silent too because if we had said anything, we would have been spotted. When we reached the path, a random woman came on her bike and started talking to him. I guess that she knew him because she greeted him and asked about his walk or something. My friend then stood on something and made some noise. I think a branch snapped. They looked up at us, so at that, we ran away. I don't know what was going on there that day, but it was a, a really strange circumstance and something that's always stuck with me. So, for a couple of weeks now, I've been seeing humanoid figures in my room, like standing on the edge of my bed or beside it or behind items. They look like shadows and they just stand there, sometimes sort of swaying. I've had some mental health issues lately and I realize that they could be hallucinations, but the hallucinations that I've had are very different to this. For ages, I've been waking up between 1 or 3 a.m. for some reason and just recently I've started seeing these shadow people. One particular one that stands out is this weird thing really. It had hollowed out eyes that were almost pitch black. It had long fingers that were like four inches long. I use metrics, so I'm not exactly sure, but its skin was pale and it had a, a hat on its head. In fact, I'm not sure if it was a hat, I guess, but the hat was like two long cones that were black and white striped across of it. It peeked out from behind a box in my room, then went back behind it. When I shined my flashlight on my phone towards it, there was nothing. Now, I would just chalk all of this up to hallucinations, but I've had other weird things happen too. Like my blanket being pulled or tugged on, or a feeling like something is on it or holding it down. But these are very physical experiences too, and I really don't know what to make of them. Does anyone know what to do about any of this and what precautions I should take? I'm losing a lot of sleep over this too, and I would like a, a fast solution if that's possible because, man, I'm absolutely exhausted. So, for context, I'm an 18-year-old female who used to work at a 24-hour subway. I worked there for almost two years until I quit this past July. For over a year... I was one of the store openers and would get there around 7 in the morning to start tasks. Keep in mind, I would usually be alone until around maybe 9 or 10 when another co-worker's shift would start. And even though I only have a few scary stories from my two years of working there, which all in all is pretty good considering how long I was there for, I and some of my old co-workers still believe that it was haunted. So one morning when I was alone, I was standing in the back when... I heard from the front a woman's voice saying hello three times. It was almost like a loud whisper, I would say, and of course, my first instinct is that the bell that we have on the door didn't work and a customer is out there waiting. Except, when I walked out to the front, there was no one there. Not even a car outside of the store. The song on the radio was a familiar song from the 90s, sang by a male artist, so there was no way that it could have been that. And why would an artist put background vocals of a creepy whisper in a song anyways? In fact, I remember hearing the first hello and turning my head and listening more carefully as it said hello two more times. So I know for a fact that I didn't imagine it. After this instance, I had another, a while later, where I was in the back and heard one of our bread cabinet doors slam shut out front. 
this is a very distinct noise for anyone who has worked in a subway because we are constantly getting bread and closing the cabinets. Immediately after I heard it shut, I ran out the back to, again, see nothing. No customers, no cars out front, nothing. We also don't like to keep bread cabinets open since air could get in and make the bread stale, so I know for a fact that I didn't leave it open for the wind to shut it. My last story happened more than once on different occasions and I would like to think that this was the spirit messing with me and wanting me to think that I was crazy. Again, I would be in the back alone when I would hear what sounded like somebody sweeping the floor in the front towards the cash register. It was a sort of swooshing noise that would happen over and over again for at least three seconds at a time. The thing is, is that I would move slightly and it would start, and when I stopped moving, it took another second for it to stop, so I knew that it wasn't me making the noise. For example, I would take a step and there would be a swoosh, I would stop, and it would swoosh again, and then it would stop. It would happen sometimes five times in a row until I would walk to the front that is like three feet away and see nothing again. Also, it would only ever happen when I was alone and would start to happen when I was just sitting or standing around on my phone in the back. I feel like the spirit, or whatever it was, wanted me to think that I was the one making the swoosh noise while also making me feel creeped out at what I was hearing. Also, whenever I heard the swooshing noise... I pictured a woman with blonde hair and a white dress, which I don't know why, but it just popped up in my head when I heard it. At the time of these things last year, I was in a bad mental place and exhausted from always being out of the house at school, work, or competitive dance, which is why I feel like the spirit only really showed itself to me because, I don't know, I think I was a bit low and didn't have many friends at school and all that. Even though those are my only experiences, I I still feel as though there was a woman's spirit roaming around somewhere in that subway, as crazy as that sounds. So I, a 19 year old female, was asked to sing at a naturalization ceremony in my city by my old vocal teacher. My aunt works in the building next door and came to watch and record me to watch later. I'm relatively small and have yet to meet someone who I can truly say I got bad feelings from. I wore a formal dress, not too long, not too short, and shorts underneath because the forecast said that it would be windy that day. The building was about three blocks from the nearest parking garage and since it was mid-work day, all the street parking was full or cut off by construction. So... After the naturalization ceremony finished, I went with my aunt to get lunch and hang out in her office. After we finished eating, she walked me to the corner of her office and said that she would watch me walk the next few blocks and turn the corner. I never walked that area of town alone before. I was super tired and busy trying to make sure my dress didn't fly up along with my hair and my face. I just wanted to get to my car and get home. When suddenly... This man stepped in front of me and asked where the district court was, where the naturalization took place, so I knew where that was at least, and I pointed behind me and kept walking. My aunt texted me and told me to call her once I turned the corner. I did so and she asked who the man was. I told her that he asked where the court was and I showed him. She told me to keep walking and let her know when I get to my car. Once I got to my car I let her know and... She said that he followed me down the block until he looked back and saw her watching with her phone out. She said that upon seeing her, he turned off another road quickly and began walking away with something in his hand and made sure that I was okay while being on the phone with me. I got home and I was shaking the whole time because that could have ended a lot differently. In fact, I could have not come home that day. I might not have even made it to my car, in fact. So, what I just experienced is really hard for me to overlook. I guess what I'm trying to say is that you guys win. Ghosts are real. Twice now I've had a, a weird experience in the same place. My grandma's attic. Once a couple of years ago and just five minutes ago the second time. 
Let me start with the prequel. To give you an idea, my grandma has a house and the attic is basically like a second floor over the whole house. It's filled with all sorts of things that we dump up there that we don't need. Tools, firewood, old toys from childhoods, etc. Also up there is a short chair and a coffee table. When I take them out of the attic to the balcony, it's my favorite place to smoke in the house. Tobacco, not weed. I really enjoy the view and the wind and sometimes though I'm just too lazy to bring them out and I just smoke in the attic looking around at all the junk. Now one day I was going to go up there when as soon as I stepped foot on the first stair I got a sort of fight or flight response for seemingly no reason. It was the middle of the day. I've been in the attic a thousand times. I'm not scared of it at all in fact. I mean I'm not a kid or anything but for some reason I was just getting chills and my heart was beating quickly. As soon as I went up to the last step I stopped and looked around the attic. I had nothing to be afraid of but it was just sort of like instinct I guess. I, I couldn't go into the attic without checking it out first. I spent like 30 seconds just looking into the attic in silence before the courage came back to me to walk forward. While walking towards the table for some reason I had the thought of what if a demon's watching me right now and that's why I, I had a bad feeling? I instantly laughed it off though and thought to myself, let him show himself. I'll show him who's boss. And as soon as I finished that thought, I heard a loud shuffle like somebody's footsteps dragged out onto the ground. I instantly froze midway and just looked in the direction where they came from. I spent at least a minute just looking, frozen, expected a, a big rat or something to pop out from somewhere over there and... When I finally got my courage back again, as soon as I was about to continue to the table and finally do what I came for, another loud noise froze me. This time, a distorted piano played, and I kid you not, it was the most demonic, out-of-tune chord that you could imagine. Like, a sound a horror movie producer would put on jump scare or something. On cue, I of course immediately dashed towards the stairs and I noped out of there quickly. I went downstairs, entered the room my family was in, and tried my best to pretend like I wasn't running from a demon. My mother heard the piano though, and she thought that I'd found my childhood toys and was fooling around with them. I went with that story and told her that, surprisingly, the batteries were still holding out. They must be good. I wasn't about to tell my family that I seriously thought that there was a demon in the attic. They would have looked at me like I was crazy. Anyway... After I spent a couple of minutes downstairs regaining my composure, I started to think about things rationally again. I felt ashamed that I got scared of nothing. I mean, I'm an adult, and so I picked up my small balls and went up there again, determined to find that piano and ease my mind forever. I went up, immediately walked up to the place where the sound came from, and picked up off the wall a big garbage bag filled with toys from my childhood. I started taking things out and found it, a cheap Chinese dingy toy piano. I tried pressing the keys, but to my shock, there was no sound. I flipped it around, opened the battery compartment, and had a brain fart when I saw that there were no batteries in that thing whatsoever. I took it down with me, found some batteries and put them in, tried playing it, but still no sound. Unfortunately, that day... I really failed to ease my mind. So over the next couple of weeks, I spent quite some time thinking about that incident. As time went on, I started rationalizing it more and more, I guess, thinking that maybe pianos like that make their final sound when their circuit board finally dies, kind of like parting words or whatever. Maybe the shuffle that I heard was from my own feet, but because of the fear, it sounded like it was somebody else's. But the only thing that I couldn't make sense of, though, was... How this piano that has been in that garbage bag for 15 years found energy without batteries to make a sound out of its speakers and a loud one at that. I even went looking for answers, hoping someone could ease my mind and offer an explanation at one point. In the end, as time went on, I, I guess I just brushed it off and told myself, I'm no engineer, I don't know how currents work and stuff. It could be some weird way that that happened and it was normal and... It was just a coincidence. I went to the attic countless times after that too and nothing else ever happened. No weird sounds, no unexplained paranoia, 
just peace and quiet, as it always was. Well, that is right until today. You see, recently, we've been doing construction work on the house every weekend. I go up to the attic 20 times a day at least to fetch something or to have a smoke break. We finished the work and went to bed. And now, before you accuse me of being a skeptic rationalizer, I try to keep an open mind. Recently, I've been getting into trying out astral projection, and it's a nice little meditation gig, I guess. I haven't succeeded yet, but the effects are quite trippy, and it's fun. So, I'm laying in bed, browsing the AP subreddit, before I decide that I'm going to go up there to smoke one last cigarette before I go to sleep. The front door is loud, and I don't smoke in the house, so the attic is really the only place that I can go. But, in the same exact way... As soon as I set foot on that first stair, I get this immense feeling that something is amiss. Now, some years have passed since the last time that this happened, and naturally, my small balls have grown at least a little bit, so I didn't stop this time. I just went up and sat on my smoke table. I lit my cigarette, remembered the last time that this happened in the piano. Like any sane person, I started a monologue in my head to banish the potential ghosts, my monologue continued until my cigarette went out, and here's a reaction. I don't know if there's demons up here or whatnot, but you can't spook me. I can't touch you right now, but I'm learning this technique that lets me come into your house. Trust me, tonight I'm coming and I'm going to kill you, as revenge for when you scared me, etc, etc. Now is your last chance to try and scare me, so come on, just try it. And I put my cigarette out quite amused of my own little internal monologue. And here we go again. As soon as I finished my monologue and said, try me, a loud sound as something on my left drags across the floor. This time though, I caught it with my peripheral vision as I turned around. A sack filled with dried sticks for the fireplace was moving by itself across the floor, defying the laws of physics. Gravity cannot do that. There's no way that it could move that distance by itself, especially when there's so much friction that it made a loud sound. It's not that heavy, so it can't slide like that or even cause that friction unless somebody is pushing it from the top. At that, I shot up and stayed fixated on this thing, convinced not to let a rat, for example, run away without me seeing it. It didn't move for a couple of seconds, so I went up to it took all the sticks out, checked every corner of that thing, and there were no rats inside. I put the sticks back in, said out loud, don't touch that again. I said my piece already, and I meant it. If there really was an evil entity up there, I'm going to banish it. Although at that point, I was starting to feel like I was bluffing. I walked back to the stairs, but before I went down, I stopped and looked back at the attic. And although my knees were weak, my arms were heavy, vomit on my sweaty, perhaps even mum's spaghetti, I wasn't going to give in to my fear, so I stared into the void for a couple of seconds to establish my dominance. And again, as if a reply, the sack lightly got dragged, though this time just a little bit for a split second. I spent a couple more seconds looking at it, and then slowly backed away, went down the stairs with a confident walk, shaking a little, I'll admit. Originally, I was going to go to bed, but adrenaline got a little high, so now I'm sitting on the toilet writing this, maybe with a ghost proofreading over my shoulder, who knows. Anyway, this seemingly uneventful experience, I just found it too powerful to ignore. I don't think that I can ever rationalize it, to be honest. There's just too many things on top of each other, like the strong fight or flight reaction that I get before the event, the timing that makes this feel like a reply, the hard to explain sound and movement. I am now a believer and I just can't rationalize things by myself anymore. I don't know if this spirit could be good or bad, so I won't take any extra measures right now, so please don't reply with like throw salt in it or something. But unless I wake up with a cigarette burn on my cheek and come asking for help with how to banish a demon, then I guess this is how it is for now. I'm going to go upstairs again in a second to smoke one more cigarette and just feel out the vibe. 
I might spend some more time with monologues up there tomorrow as well, just to see what will happen, but for now, I really don't know what to make of all of this, and yeah, if you've got any ideas about how this could have happened in a sort of natural way, then I am all ears. My mum passed away when I was super young, before I even really knew her, so I spent a while with my dad when I was really young. In fact, my earliest memories were living at my grandma's place. The house was a big house near the beach. My grandma and grandpa built the house, so no one had lived there before us. Anyways, I love that house, but a specific area of the house always made everyone feel, like, uncomfortable. This area was in the basement near a cellar. My memory back then is kind of foggy because it was so long ago, but I remember spending a lot of time with my grandma since my dad was working and whatnot. Now, we used to pray every night, go to church every Sunday, and I was fairly Catholic at the time. And I remember eventually seeing these shadow people. They looked almost like skeletal shadows that would peek out from behind doorways and corners, signaling me to follow them. They also had glowing eyes and a, a sharp, almost jagged, black, shadowy, skeletal body. Now, I remember ignoring them for a long time, but one day, growing curious, I followed one. I saw one near my grandma's room doorway and walked to the doorway, turning the corner, and when I did, it was gone. Then it reappeared at the stairway to the basement down the hall and signaled me to follow again. I followed it again and it was gone this time appearing at the bottom of the stairs in the basement. As a kid, I was terrified of that basement, so at that point I stopped following. Some more time passed and eventually curiosity took the better of me and I ended up following it into the basement the next time that they showed up. When I turned the corner in the basement, I remember seeing this person. They were towering above me. I'm like five or six years old tops though, so everyone towered over me, but you get the point. And they had a, like, a deer skull with horns instead of antlers for a head, wore a big fur cloak, and behind them was just darkness. I remember them slowly pointing at me, then I screamed and I ran for it right back up the stairs. Over the next couple of weeks, I'd see this thing in different places. One time hanging itself off the door, other times standing in the trees near the river. I learned later my family was getting messed with in a way of weird dreams and odd events like poltergeist stuff as well. But eventually I stopped seeing this thing in person and it plagued my dreams instead. I couldn't get a night's sleep without this thing appearing, turning it into a nightmare until sometime I remember someone coming to me in the dream. They told me to fight and banish this being and so I did. I remember in the dream grabbing a broom handle or a stick and hitting this thing when it showed up. The dream seemed to sort of crack and it was at that point that I woke up. I realize dreams are weird things so I really don't know what to make of that. It could be nothing. But years went by and I forgot about the whole thing until I was about 13 or 14-ish. I was hanging out with some friends and as we were walking back to my buddy's place, one night I remember his sister turning around and asking, what's that? To which we all turn around. And at the end of the street... We all saw this tall entity, deer skull with horns and a big fur coat at the end of the street under one of the lights. My memories came back to me and I just remember saying, we need to leave. We proceeded to run back to my friend's place and aside from some odd moments like the power going out and doors opening and closing, it seemed to leave us alone. But a few months later, I'm in the gymnasium bleachers watching some sports in my high school when... I suddenly start to feel tired. Now, I was resting kind of against the railing when I almost blacked out, which could have caused me to fall off the railing suddenly, and then I saw that deer skull image appear in my mind and I was snapped wide awake. The next few years, it was sort of off and on. I would see this thing, then some of my friends or my brother and his friends would as well. When I was around though, it always made everything darker and the smell of like mildew would suddenly become very noticeable too. It seemed to attack one of my friends once. It gave me a scar on my wrist that I've pretty well had my whole life and I moved out of my hometown years ago and kind of figured that it was gone but 
back in February, I was walking home one night and felt a similar feeling, only to look over at the trees and see him standing there. First time that I've seen him in a few years, so it caught me off guard for sure. I still have no idea exactly what it is, and though the running theory is a, a nature spirit of some kind due to the alleged history of the land of my hometown, that is honestly just a wild guess, and like I said, I have no idea what this is, and I don't know what to do about it. So last night I was recording guitar in my studio and I heard someone moving about but nobody was there so I just kept on recording. A while later my wife brought in her toddler. As usual he strummed the acoustic on its stand and caused usual ruckus of unplugging my guitar cords and all that. She took him and put him into bed and I bent down, plugged everything back in and decided to go take a smoke. As I went through the house I could hear them in the bedroom getting ready for bed. I'm outside for like 10 minutes and my wife comes out and says, are you out here? I just saw you in the studio and I said, I've been out here for like 10 minutes. She says, I just walked through your studio seconds ago and saw you bending down as I walked through to the garage. She continued and said, what are you doing down there? But when I came back through seconds later, you were gone. Now, we have not had any paranormal activity in the 22 years that we've lived in this house. Nothing like this has ever happened. And it was odd for me to sense a presence earlier and for her to see me when I wasn't there. And this whole thing just gives me chills. I was about nine years old. My dad, me and my siblings went on a vacation to my grandparents' house that's so far away from home. To visualize the setting too, my grandparents' house was half renovated with the living room and the upstairs room. It was a deteriorating ancestral house, but the kitchen and the bathroom, the upstairs that used to be a boarding house with a few rooms and the backyard was still the original house, not renovated at the time. Everything was still in construction mode, so the TV was in the kitchen because the living room was a complete mess. So, it was midnight and we were watching a TV show with two of my cousins, my sister and my aunt. We'd laugh so loud at the shows and during advertisements cracking jokes. And after a while, there was a really loud noise from upstairs. It sounded like kids running around and we thought that it was my aunt's children playing, but... We didn't even have the time to react or shout at them because this loud noise came downstairs and I think the best way to describe it is like a, a brown colored wind or a smoke sped down with stomping sounds down the wooden stairs. It passed by the TV and into the sink where the glasses and the rack rattled and well, we just were all frozen in shock and fear and confusion. The wind came back from the sink it seemed, past the TV again and went up again to the stairs with the stomping feet noise which sounded like it was in a hurry running up the stairs. The frames hanging on the walls of the stairs shook and one of them even fell. Honestly at the time I couldn't believe that I had just witnessed what I had seen. Something that to this day I just cannot explain. And it was just so random and out of the blue like that too. I've told this story to a lot of people. Some don't believe me and some do but... My aunt who always cooked in that kitchen said that she was used to that paranormal stuff as well as my cousins and my dad who grew up in that house. In fact, they just seemed to brush it off the day after, but my mind as a child at that time was horrified to my core. I couldn't forget about it. But that experience is something that will haunt me forever, I think. Even now in my adulthood, it's something that I vividly remember. When I was a child, about maybe six to seven at my best guess, I lived in a haunted house. The owner's mother apparently died there and there are rumors that it was used as a drug den before the owner started renting it out. Anyhow, I used to see a gown float by the doorway and I would also have very like demonic dreams for a lack of a better term. Two incidents stand out as potentially demonic to me anyway. Once when I was lying down to sleep, I heard a commanding deep voice say, there's somebody in the house. 
that's it. No follow-up and nothing else. I've never had another incident like that in my entire life. But the second incident was one night when I woke up out of a deep sleep and saw a face on the ceiling. I drew it for my mother and she had me checked out. I was fine. So she instead had the house blessed. And after that we never had an issue since. But fast forward about two and a half years ago when my first daughter was about to be born. For about two months I had a reoccurring nightmare where a tall man in a black hat sort of like a top hat but sort of misshapen too would stand at the foot of the bed and just sort of watch me upon waking i would have sleep paralysis for a few seconds and in those moments i could still see and feel him my wife would often wake me up claiming that i was screaming no who are you or other times just mumbling but after my daughter was born i only had one other incident I was rocking her back to sleep in her crib and I saw my wife open the door a crack and stand by it looking in. I asked her to come in but for some reason she didn't move. I said babe and nothing. At the same time I went to the door to open it all the way. I heard her groggy voice from the adjacent bedroom, our room, say, huh, what? I'll never forget it, exactly how it sounded and everything. As the door opened, I had a flash of just white void where a face would be, along with the rest of what I can only describe as a, a figure exactly as tall as I am, I guess. It vanished in a moment, and I ran to my bedroom and sat in bed with my daughter. Every single hair on my arms and neck stood straight up that night, and I've never felt anything so terrifying since then. Now, everything has been fine since that event for years, and here and there random things will happen, I guess. Nothing that can't be explained. Like, I had a buddy stay at my house one night when my wife and daughter were with her sister visiting her grandfather, and he said that he was awoken in the early morning by two male voices discussing something. He asked if I had somebody come to the door in the middle of the night, and I hadn't. But other than that, there's really nothing out there. That said though, in our most recent home, about three months ago, my daughter began experiencing night terrors too. I had them as a kid and they're truly heartbreaking. The only thing that I can do is hold her arms and head still so she doesn't hurt herself. She'll scream at me, growl, hit me, throw herself around, the whole works. Everything that I've read said that they don't remember from the next day and they're asleep for the whole thing. It's really heartbreaking though, but... It makes me feel better knowing that she doesn't really remember the incidences. Anyway, around the same time this started, things started moving around in the house. What I mean is that we'll hear cabinets open and shut, hear something thump or bang, and I've even seen shadow figures hiding around walls as I walk past. One night, while reading to her, she and I both witnessed a sock move itself across her bedroom floor. I know she saw it too because when I walked her by the spot on the floor to get her out of the room, she stopped and looked down at it, clearly puzzled. I tried to play it off to her and my wife and I chalked it up to air currents, but there's just no way that that was an air current. After this though, I saged the home immediately and I've been trying to keep everyone's minds off of it, but it's getting worse. My daughter is waking up in the middle of the night screaming no or mine. Sometimes she seems like she's having a conversation with someone, but when we go to investigate, obviously nothing is there and she's fast asleep. Last night too, I had something happen on the baby monitor that I just couldn't explain. I took some photos of it, but unfortunately I really don't have a way of sharing them here. But in a nutshell, for about 30 seconds, I could see a really large shadowy head behind my daughter's own head on the monitor. I took a photo of it on my phone to send to my buddy to see what he thought. My wife was asleep at this point with our four-month-old. When I checked the monitor again, though, it was gone. To me, it was clear as day, and although he says that he sees it, he does think that it could just be a shadow. Anyhow... I'm pretty much at my wit's end now. I'm terrified that I've harbored something all these years from my own childhood, and now it's planning to torment my daughter. Does anyone have any experience with this or any advice? 
Anything at all at this point, I'll take it. I thought the saging would help, but... I don't know, it, it almost seemed to, like, tick it off even more, and... Maybe... It's made things even worse. This story occurred a few years back. I would have been around eight or nine at the time. So my old bedroom sat facing out towards the street and also happened to be right next door to our front door. It was very small as it had been built in place of our old front porch. The roof was slanted, slatted downward, sort of towards the window which took up most of the wall and the bed could only fit in one way. It was painted purple, not a nice purple either, like a kid's bedroom of course. But my bed sat facing towards the door to my bedroom, parallel to the window. My closet took up part of the corner between my bedroom door and the window, making for a sort of unusual space I guess. And every night I, I would always check to make sure the curtains were shut all the way as the idea of people watching from the street made me really uncomfortable even at a young age where things like that shouldn't have even really crossed my mind, I guess. Every night I slept soundly, no nightmares, no sudden noises waking me in the middle of the night, nothing. That was until the middle of the year during a, a school break. I remember waking to the sound of just someone breathing. I couldn't move, couldn't catch my breath. I was just sort of stuck. But what I do remember seeing so clearly was a man stood in the corner of my room, stuck partly behind the curtain as if it would hide him. Of course, I could see him though. He was just this dark entity who stood and watched me. And after what felt like hours, I was able to get back to sleep. In the morning, I told my mum about what happened and she explained that it was just a strange nightmare and that I would be fine. But the way she said it was just very not believable, I guess. But these cases of sleep paralysis, too, went on for about a year, taking me up to the middle of the next year when I was likely eight or nine. I remember waking in the middle of the night, just like I had most nights for the last year, to the man in the corner. Only this time, I could move. I didn't dare move though, I stayed absolutely still, despite now knowing that he was actually there. I, I could hear his faint breathing like he was trying to hide from me as much as I was trying to hide from him. I couldn't help but think, has this man been here every night this year? I remember the thoughts that I had, how I would run out of the room and scream for my mum, how she would call the police, how this man would be arrested and sent away. But I just couldn't do that. I mean, he was basically in front of the door. Instead, I spent the night staring at him, trying to fall asleep. I'd say it was around 5am I was finally able to drift off. Just sort of as the birds started to wake up, really. I woke up and, lo and behold, he was gone. The first thing that I did was tell my mum. She already looked uneasy, like she already knew as well. And that's when I heard two people talking outside. I found out later the people outside were my neighbor and a police officer who was taking an eyewitness statement. Because apparently, around 6 in the morning, our neighbor spotted a man standing outside of my window. She called the police, but he was gone before they arrived. Other neighbors stepped forward saying that they'd seen him outside in the middle of the day, looking at our house too. There were no signs of forced entry, only two footprints in the flower bed outside of my window. My mother told the officers my account of what happened and they came to the conclusion that he'd done the same thing last year. I saw it and it sparked my tangent of sleep paralysis. The street light outside projected his shadow so it appeared as though he was standing in my room. This whole time he'd been waiting patiently outside of my room. Honestly, who knows what would have happened too if my neighbor didn't spot him on her way out to work. Just a few minutes and she could have missed him entirely. When I have to walk to my bus stop, it's always five in the morning. Given that it's only entering summer or spring for me now, 
It's only starting to lighten up at this time. This happened though mid to end of fall, so it was still pretty dark out at five. During my walk, I have to walk along a sort of non-busy road with few lights that often go out too because of the timing, so it's pretty dark there. I live right by a middle school, but they started around eight, so it's empty that early in the morning. I was walking past this school too when this car had pulled up and into the parking lot. They had rolled down their window and said something to me. I couldn't really hear it exactly, but I sort of sped up. It left the parking lot and drove up again to the intersection. I noticed the car had very tinted windows and also had no license plate on it, front or back. The car was waiting to turn, despite there being no reason not to, as there were no cars passing by. I stood still, and it was at this point that I called my dad, then waiting until I watched it turn and drive away before continuing to walk. It's about a 15-minute walk between my house and the bus stop, and my mum had taken my pepper spray, so I didn't have it on me. I stayed on the phone with my dad for the rest of the call, but... I think about this often when I'm walking and how I'm only ever the only person walking the path at 5 o'clock in the morning. I make sure to keep my pepper spray on me these days and my finger on the trigger. However, I'm looking to get something more like a pocket knife or a taser instead. I feel pepper spray would have been severely ineffective in this situation. This is something that happened to me when I was around 15 or 16. I, a 24 year old female now, used to be painfully shy as a kid, so I had a few small groups of friends that I was always around. My first day of sophomore year, I met this guy, his name was Seth, 18 to 19 year old male, in one of the classes who seemed a little bit strange. I didn't think too much of it though at the time because he seemed really nice to be honest. Finally, it was time for my favorite period, lunch. Lunch was reserved for my favorite people, two boys who graciously accepted awkward 13-year-old me after a dramatic move to my dad's home. One of the boys was actually my best friend and my first boyfriend. His name was Jay. So we were really close and I trusted him more than anyone else at the time. The other, his name was Harry, was in the same class with me where I met Seth. Anyway, I sit at our table and we begin to start comparing teachers when Seth randomly joins our table. I figured that he was one of their friends or something, so we just continued like normal. After a few weeks, I started getting a little bit creeped out by Seth. He seemed to be sort of like everywhere that I went in the school and always stood way too close to me. If I asked him to take a step back, he would point out other guy friends who stood closer it was usually the same two guys he would use as examples. But for context, I'm in a wheelchair and he was really tall, so my head was the same level as that area. I eventually found out that he had seen what my school login was and saved it to his computer. Now, I didn't want to immediately freak out and report him, so I decided that I was going to just ask him to delete it. He said that he would and that that was the end of that. But... As the months go on, Seth started to get worse. The class that we had was a film class where the students would go out during the period in groups to do the project independently. This was very scary too because he would immediately claim me and his group and I was too nice to decline until we were put into pairs. He always tried to get me to go film with him in the back fields behind our school. The way that he would suggest it to... It got me so scared that I would refuse to leave the room. My teacher was amazing and didn't force anyone to go out, but he would end up doing it alone and I would edit it. Now, while Seth was out, I decided to see if he deleted my login and he had it. He had at least 20 other logins saved on this document and I was scared enough at this point to report it to my counselor. My counselor was a complete idiot for a lack of better terms and decided to tell him that a girl in his class had reported him. I found out because the next day he came to lunch and started accusing me and seemed really angry. 
I, I denied it, and Jay and Harry stuck up for me. It was shortly after this that I found out that neither of my friends actually knew Seth. He only knew of me when he joined our table. My counselor decided that my concerns were not important enough to notify our teacher or police. I guess it wasn't serious enough to warrant anything outside the school. They didn't even notify my dad, believe it or not. After everything happened with the report, though, he went back to being creepy, but in a worse way this time. Every day he would try to convince me to go somewhere with him behind our school and it had gotten to the point that he was trying to tell me that I had to. He would make up excuses for us to go somewhere alone. I didn't tell anyone about it besides the school and my teacher later because at that time I wasn't sure if it was just me being crazy or not. I do think that my friends might have expected that he was getting too pushy because they started walking with me to classes when they could. I ended up telling my teacher what was going on and he immediately started assigning seats and talked to another girl in my class to see if I could permanently join her group. Seth graduated at the end of that year and decided to resurface in my email inbox when I was 17 or 18. But at that point, I blocked him. Between the ages of two and five, I had an imaginary friend named Charlie. He was tall and thin with grey hair and brown eyes, probably around 50 to 60 years old. And the first warning sign was his age, as most imaginary friends are the same age as the child, right? He was kind though. We played together a lot. Dolls, swing sets, toys. My grandma caught me talking to him once and asked who I was talking to. I told her that I was talking to Charlie. She asked about him, so I explained him to her. What he looked like, how he acted, what he did, etc. My grandpa walked in on our conversation and was interested too, and got more and more surprised as I went on. And he went on to tell me this. A man named Charlie lived in the house next to ours in the 50s when he was growing up. Pa said that he didn't remember a lot about him, just that he was really tall and had an old car that left a big trail of black smoke behind it. The house Charlie supposedly lived in was just a stone porch now, as the rest of it burned down decades ago. Charlie had a wife, Eliza. She died a few years after they got married. She apparently ended her own life. His next wife, Rose, though, lived in another city and refused to move down to Charlie's house until he built her a porch. So he did, and they married, and she moved in. She died about nine or ten years later. She was getting ready for bed, apparently, when her nightgown caught on fire from the fireplace in their room. Everything in the house got burnt down with her, everything except the porch, which didn't have even a burn mark on it, apparently. The wooden door leading to the porch was completely fine, too. It's still there, in fact, and I go see it every time that I visit my grandparents. Anyway... Charlie, he died in the 1960s from heart failure. He lived with his sister until he passed away and then I suppose that he must have come back to see how everything was doing and apparently decided to stay. This story goes back to when I was 14 years old. I lived with my grandparents but had regular visitation with my mother my mum and I were on good terms and summer was coming up so she planned a small family get together on a weekend that I would be at her house. I was super excited for this because I could see my cousins and relatives from that side of the family, for the weekend that is, and spend the rest of the week with my mum. And the first day went really great. We went muddying and got messy and had a really good time together. When night came things really cooled down a bit and we decided that we would watch a movie so we watched a movie about greasers and had a character named Pony Boy in it. I know the name of the movie, but I can't think of it at the moment. But anyway, it was not a scary film by any means. Bedtime hits and I struggled with insomnia and stayed up later than most of the people staying over that night. When I finally went to bed, I swore that I could hear knocking on the bedroom door. Uh, yeah? Hey, uh, it's Mike. Come to the kitchen. The problem with this whole scenario is that 
My Uncle Mike was in the house and had a very thick country accent. This voice sounded like it was trying badly to fake that accent. Uh, no, I'm trying to get some sleep. I'm making a cake and I left you the knife to cut it with. This didn't make any sense to me at all. So I opened the door and said, I'm not cutting a damn cake at like one in the morning. When I did, there was nobody there. But there was a large knife by the door. For some reason, I assumed Mike was joking with me, so I put the knife up in the kitchen and got the strangest onset of fight or flight that I have ever had. So I ran. I ran into a room my cousin was sleeping in because he was three or four years older than me, and I just acted on instinct. When I ran into the room, the door was shut, and I opened it, closed it, and I locked it. I woke him up and tried to explain what was up, but he just sort of tossed over and said that I could sleep with him in his bed if I wanted. I was scared and remember seeing that it was like 1.30 in the morning at this point. Mr. Lonely was playing and a pale blue light was in the room. The next morning comes and my aunt asks me why I was knocking on their bedroom door asking her to come to the kitchen that night. I tell her that I wasn't. She asks why my cousin's door was open with the light on at 2am. I tell her that I ran in and closed the door and locked it at 1.30 and there was only a blue nightlight on. She tells me that it was not what she saw and she said that she saw the door completely open, the lights on and could hear talking from the room. When I asked her why her husband Mike was knocking at my door at 1am, she said that Mike went to work at midnight and didn't come back until 6 in the morning. We all got suspicious at this and took a flip phone around asking questions and got audio captured saying, I am Mike and I am still here very clearly. We didn't hear it when we asked it, but we did in the recording. I don't know what happened that night, but it never happened again to my knowledge and it still bothers me all these years later. Now, I know that this is really weird, so bear with me, but it happened about six months ago. As I was falling asleep, a mean, sort of evil voice said, your dad's going to die. It was really evil sounding. It was so scary, in fact, that I prayed to God to protect my dad because I really wasn't sure if it was a dream or not. It felt real and vivid, but obviously I didn't tell anyone about it. The very next day, I started feeling like really dizzy and nauseous, and it was so bad that I couldn't even stand up straight. The whole room was spinning at one point. Then my dad called me. He said that he was scared because he was dizzy and nauseous as well. It was really weird because it was like I was experiencing the exact same thing at that very moment. I was asking him questions like if he had chest pains, and suddenly he just stopped responding. I'm like, Dad, answer me or I'm calling 911. And there was no response, so I called 911. My dad lives like 35 minutes from me and I felt pretty helpless at the time. I prayed again and remembered my dream and was in a total panic. My dizziness went away and the paramedics got there and my dad was conscious. He refused to go to the hospital because he's stubborn like that. But long story short, we went to a doctor, had a CT scan done, and one of his arteries was severely blocked and he suffered a mini stroke. He had surgery and he's doing okay these days. However, his memory is worse than ever and I'm scared about vascular dementia at this point. I'm still glad that he's here and the odd thing is that, why did the voice sound so evil, I guess? I mean, it literally warned me. I believed my prayers helped the situation, but I'm really confused about it. There's no way that this was just a coincidence. I mean, it literally happened the next day, and... Anyway, the whole thing was really weird, something that I'll never forget, and I just thought that I should share it. This is an encounter from a, a few years back now, I think autumn of 2017. I'll try to remember what was said, but 
I admit that it might be a bit off. It was a dark part of the year, only a few street lights, but the wet asphalt seemed to absorb all the light and make the scenery even darker where I lived. So, I had moved into my late mum's house a few years before. It was on a nice neighbourhood, but close to one particularly bad area, and it also had a really bad apartment building that was known as Murder Alley. It was a dangerous neighbourhood, with a few mailmen killed, doors broken with axes, passers-by thrown at with old TVs, stones and more, drug users and shady people living there. I was suspicious towards strangers on the streets and avoided telling where I lived pretty much all the time. But one evening I left to the store a short walk away and met a stranger, just after leaving my yard that is. He had dirty clothes, greasy hair and seemed kind of off right away. But he came towards me and started to talk. Hey uh, where does, and he gave a name, live? He asked this in a sort of annoyed tone. I have no idea who he's looking for, so I say, Um, sorry, I really don't know. Why? He sounded even more annoyed. Well, I didn't live here, I said, as I tried to stay calm. I hurried past him and didn't look back. I was too scared to possibly find him staring at me even more, or following me. He was a big guy, heavily built and maybe like a bit over six foot, and I was a five foot tiny woman. I just went to the store and I did my shopping. Afterwards, I started walking home and I saw the guy standing right in the shadows behind the shop's corner. I kept walking and when turning in my driveway, I glanced behind me and I saw him following me and I walked through my dark yard inside my house and didn't put the lights on but peeked through the window facing the street. The guy was standing there next to my mailbox staring at my window. I sort of took a few steps back, freaked out and just waited in the dark. I messaged my friend group what was happening so they could check on me if something happened. I said that I had an axe next to my door if the guy would try to come in. One of my friends, my now boyfriend, told me to call the police at once. I took a glance outside again quickly and the strange guy turned away and just left. So I didn't end up making the call. I never saw that dude again, but I'm really glad that I didn't get to turn into an axe murderer in self-defense. The murder alley was torn down a couple of years after and the bad vibe disappeared with it. The area is now way more peaceful than it has ever been since the apartment building was built in the 1960s. It was the summer of 87 and I was four years old at this time. I remember this too like it was yesterday, but I, a male 38 now, used to live in a small town in southern Indiana in 87. The schools were shut for the summer break. Me and my cousin, who'd frequent us from another city a hundred miles away, went out to play on scorching summer afternoons. We had found this massive pile of construction sand at a nearby site where we would spend most of the time making sandcastles and such. Right next to this massive pile of sand was a large water tank built with poured concrete and filled to the brim with water. Me and my cousin, when we'd get bored with the sand, would sometimes sit by this large tank. It did appear to be large for us four and six year olds, I think now anyway. And we would look at the tadpoles, which my older cousin convinced me were small fish. Neither of us could swim at this age, and being cautious even at that age, never ventured too close to the tank. That day, for some reason, what I do not recall was that my cousin had to head back to his home a hundred miles away, rather abruptly cutting short his stay with us. I, being the only child, feeling lonely with nothing else to do, decided to head back to the construction sand pile. But there was this other kid, a bit older than I was, who'd I'd never seen before. He was sitting by the water tank and chucking a piece of rope with a stick tied to one end in the water and would pull it back. I simply loved this toy that he'd fashioned out of rope plus a stick and asked if I could join him. For sure, he said. He made up rules of a new game, rather on the spot. You sit at the other end of the tank. I'll chuck the stick end of the rope at you, holding the rope end. If you manage to catch it, then you win your turn. 
If it hits the water, you'll lose a point. Deal? What four-year-old could say no to this, right? So yeah, we started this game. I think I caught it a few times. Some other times the stick landed in the water. He was losing and he kept shortening the throw so that I had to keep reaching for the stick. And one fateful throw, I landed in the water. It was sudden too and I didn't realize what was happening. I was inside the water, struggling to get out, trying to hold my breath and flailing my arms. Luckily, I managed to get hold of a rung on one end of the corners of the tank and also managed to climb out. But the other kid, well, was nowhere to be found. He comes back about 20 or so minutes later. Oh, uh, you managed to come out. I looked at him, fuming. Where did you get lost? I remember asking angrily. Oh, uh, I just went to pee, he said nonchalantly. I never thought you'd make it out. The water is deep. Did you not try to find grown-ups and tell them I was drowning? He just shrugged. For a long time, I remembered this incident, every detail, what I wore that day. Except something else came to light, rather unexpectedly years later, when I was talking about this with my dad. Yeah, I know how it would have bothered you so much, feeling betrayed by your own cousin like that when you were drowning. Yeah. Years later, I realized that I had processed every bit of that incident and changed one crucial aspect in my head. There was no strange kid that day. It was my own cousin, my partner in crime. Every summer break, that for some reason, only known to him, decided to let me drown or fend for myself. My earliest encounter occurred around three or five years ago. I had decided to stay with my aunt. Her house was big with three baths and various rooms. I was on the second floor alone when everything happened. So, I was working on a video when my youthful step-aunt appeared. I followed her into her room, excited to show her what I had done with my phone. My younger cousin was also in her arms. Both of them are female. She wasn't in the room when I walked in, but I turned behind the door, thinking that she was playing a joke on me. But when I did, nobody was present. I quickly dashed downstairs to find her, but she claimed that she had not gone upstairs at all. It was a, a really weird experience, so I just stayed downstairs. I had my next incident around two or three years ago. I'm upstairs in a house by myself once more. My family's home wasn't very large, but my elder sister then arrived, bearing our little sister. I was too lazy to go and fetch something, so I called her from across the room. She walked up to the mirror and remained there still, but without responding to me, before exiting the room. I thought that that was weird, so I followed her out of the room as she went at a slow pace. When she turned a corner though, and then I did afterwards, she was nowhere to be found. I dashed downstairs once again where my elder sister was showering. My younger sister was downstairs too, playing with her toys. I was really creeped out once again, and I stayed downstairs. There were numerous parallels between these two situations that made them seem like falsehoods and fables, I guess, but... I was alone upstairs in a house that belonged to a relative. The people that came upstairs were all women and one of them was holding a female toddler. Both rooms had a bed with a mirror pointing straight into the direction of the bed and both of them happened in the afternoon. I'm still freaked out by the whole thing. I don't know what to think about it, but what do you guys think it all means? I would really love to get some help with this because I have no idea what to do next. So when I was 16, I was on my Duke of Edinburgh Silver Award expedition. It's sort of a citizenship thing for like teens and young adults. Comes in gold, silver and bronze levels and involves going on an expedition in a group of 4 to 7. But we were hiking and planning to cover about, I think 60 kilometers in 3 days to meet the requirements. You have to avoid roads as much as possible and navigate by map and compass, carrying literally everything that you need. 
Anyways, day two of the hike and we've been going most of the day. We're heading down what we think is a bridle path towards a road which we need to walk along for 100 meters or so to link up with another footpath so that we can keep going across the country. When we get to a pond that isn't marked out on a map but no problem it's borderline for the size that you'd expect to see marked. Then as we go a bit further we realize that there's a cross ahead with two paths meeting and the second path definitely should be marked but isn't. Much debate begins and we've been standing there for about five minutes going over the map trying to figure out where we are when we hear an engine coming closer. This was weird too given that you're not really supposed to drive on bridle paths but we see a little van. It's coming towards us and move back off the path because it's hard to tell someone off for driving on a bridle path after they've run you over, right? The van goes past us a little, then stops, then reverses. A middle-aged bloke cleans out and asks if we're okay. We say yes, but ask if he can tell us the way to the road. We figured that even if we've taken the wrong path, roads are far enough between that it should still be the right road and we can sort of reorientate ourselves from there and get back on the track. But then it gets weird. You see, he points to the path that we came down. Yeah, you can just go down there past my... Uh, the pond. It's about 10 minutes. Uh, tell you what, why don't I give you a lift? We say no to this. It's not allowed, but he gets out and opens the back of the van. It's carpeted and has what looks like a camera and light equipment, which he starts moving about telling us to get in. We refuse again, explaining that we'd be breaking the rules. Besides, even if the slip and telling us to go the way that he didn't know we came from hadn't weirded us out enough, the equipment definitely did. Eventually, he gives up and closes the van, gets in the front and leaves. By going down the branch that we came from, that is. The one that he told us that would lead to the road, but we knew that it didn't which was not the branch that he'd been about to go down before he reversed to speak to us. As soon as he was out of sight, it took us about 5 nanoseconds to decide that we definitely were not going either of the ways that he'd seemed interested in going down, thank you. But we decided to go down the branch that he'd come from, reasoning that he couldn't have been running back around back paths forever and if he did come back looking for us, he might be less likely to look the way that he came from. And we reached the road in less than 10 minutes. It was the single creepiest experience of my teen years. In the end too, we literally walked along the road behind a hedgerow so we'd be harder to see from the road for like a mile until we found a phone box, called our expedition leader and got him to pick us up. We heard engines two or three times and dropped to the ground behind the hedgerow every time, scared that it was this guy looking for us. I think all of us ended up in tears in the back of the minibus once the adrenaline wore off. Anyway, I'm just thankful that we made it out of there, all in one piece. So I work as an assistant in nursing. I work night shifts through an agency, meaning that I work at all kinds of facilities and places, not just at one place. I've experienced uh, multiple weird and scary things so far, but one in specific stuck out to me. I was at an aged care facility, a nursing home, upstairs down a corridor with another AIN, an RN as well, and two residents. They had just had a fight as one had dementia and tried to go into the other's room at a, a bit past three in the morning or something. For reference too, we were standing about maybe two-thirds down the hallway, which was fairly well lit until halfway down, so the corridors aren't too bright. We have enough light on so that we can see everything to the end clearly, but not enough to disturb people. At the end of the hallway are two rooms opposite each other, the one on the right being empty as the previous resident had passed away about a few months ago. As the three of us are trying to defuse the situation and get them into their rooms, I'm standing with my back to the wall, standing between the residents while the other two talk to the residents about the situation. And all of a sudden, I get this weird feeling like something just isn't quite right. 
Looking back on it, I realized that it felt like I was being watched from somewhere down the end of the corridor. Sort of uh, an instinctive feeling, I guess. So I sort of look over and that was when I see it. A brief flash of movement. What I saw was a, a black shadow figure run from left to right, but between the two rooms at the end of the corridor. No color, not transparent, and definitely not a person. Although it was sort of the shape of a tall man, I guess, but I only saw it for a second though, because as soon as it entered the darkness again of the room, it disappeared. I felt my whole body go numb though. I'd had weird experiences that I couldn't explain before, but never anything like that. We finished dealing with the situation and got them both back to bed and went to sit down in the nurse's station. Once the RN left, I spoke to my co-worker, a lady that I've worked with plenty of times before, and we have a sort of mutual trust and understanding. She also has a very confident demeanor, and so, after a while, what I started to realize what it was that I could have been looking at, and I was getting increasingly disturbed. But we eventually got to the topic of creepy things that we've experienced in night shifts, and were talking about our stories, Hearing things that we can't explain, buzzers going off for empty rooms, things being moved or buzzers being turned off, stuff like that. But when the residents in the rooms most definitely can't do it themselves. And after a bit, I explain what I saw earlier in the night to her and she just stops, looks at me with a really serious face and tells me to again describe the figure as best as I can. A tall shadow figure, no distinct features, shape of a tall man. Her smile fades quickly and she paused for a minute, taking in a deep breath before explaining that I'm not the first to see him apparently. A few of the night staff in that wing, they had seen him too, including herself, and they think that it's the resident who died in that end room as he fits the description. This resident also was incredibly protective over one of the ladies down the hall a bit as they think that he was in love with her and she was quite gentle and frail. She told me of the time that she went to check on this lady after her buzzer went off but as she walked in it had already been turned off. This was for a resident who is almost entirely immobile now and couldn't reach the off button herself. As she walked in a bit back from the foot of the bed was that same shadow figure standing facing the door waiting for her to come in and just sort of watched her. She checked the resident, looked okay and after that ran out of the room. Whatever it was it barely moved but it turned slightly as to keep watching her almost at all times. She got a co-worker to check the room and when they did nothing was there when they both went back. We then decided to go and check the end room that it ran to earlier, and nothing. The only thing out of the ordinary was the wardrobe doors were wide open as well as the bathroom door too, both with the lock somehow still engaged and working. I should also mention too that these are normally kept locked when the room is vacant to stop wandering residents from going in and hiding or getting lost and whatnot. But what we did notice was the room felt abnormally cold and had a very dark feeling about it. I've been back to work there several times since then and that room is still empty and still has that same feeling in it. I've heard some strange things down there too but nothing that you couldn't make up a decent explanation for I guess. All in all it's a really great place to work I'll admit but I will never go down there alone again. We're also pretty sure that he stays around to watch over her and protect her like he did before he passed, but I just cannot get over the overwhelming darkness that you can literally feel in that room. So, I just moved into a new house, guys, and I'll be honest, I'm really scared. I've been living here for about a month now. It's newly constructed, a couple of years. The first couple of weeks too, I felt really good. It felt so bright and cheery. Everything felt great. I got great vibes from everything about it. It felt like I'd made a great decision. Also, just to quickly preface this, I do have a carbon monoxide detector. I put it on the first night. 
So, my first couple of nights sleeping here, it already started. I would have ordered... I would have auditory hallucinations right before falling asleep, which I've never really had before. I would hear a whisper in my ear. The first one was, hello, how are you? And I quickly snapped awake. Then it's been the sounds of yelling, people bustling around me, etc. But I quickly snap up and when I do, nobody's there. I quickly started having vivid nightmares every night as well. I don't usually have vivid dreams and haven't had nightmares in like forever. It would be things like seeing the inside of my body and my heart was like infested with larvae. They were sort of squirming in and out of me and I'd see my house swarming with infestations. I'd be hurt, tortured, killed. My insides were always usually had something going wrong with them. But I shrugged this all off as it is just dreams admittedly, even though it is a bit scary. But on the third week, everything quickly went downhill. I decided to do a full tank change on my axolotl tank. It falls and crushes my fingers and leg. Then I discover a large ant infestation in the tank below it. They were so disgusting. They left like a black gooey grime everywhere that they were, festering in the corners, crawling over one another, and it made me really wretch and gag. I quickly went out, vacuumed, sprayed, and really cleaned everything up as best as I could, and placed traps. I was done with the tank change when I noticed all of the poison ants start running to the inside of the tank below, drowning and sort of killing themselves in it. I emergency move the fish into another tank and a pregnant black widow crawls up from the side. I spray her down and move her out. Then a mystery hole appears in the drywall. Spiders crawl out, crawl on the ceiling and jump onto me from the ceiling while I'm in bed. I have a high loft bed. The pest people have no clue what made the hole, but it just keeps getting bigger as well. They find no termites or any cause for it. But then I notice the fish shelf is breaking. I go out to buy a new shelf and Lowe's catches on fire while I'm in it. I leave and go wherever else I can to find a new shelf, get one and move my tanks onto it, when all the glass on the tank breaks and they all fall. This new tank, less than a year old and a good brand, just suddenly like burst. I put them in a bucket and buy them a new tank. I clean and add a new filter, new heater, feed them goodnight. I wake up and all of their skin is now falling off and they're half dead. I emergency change the water and it's no good. Then my cat gets cat fleas and I don't know where and how. He starts to retch and vomit and peeing blood. Half of my electrical appliances met their end in these few days. I threw away so many things that it pains me, in fact. Like things for my fish, extension cords, vacuums, my hair curler fizzled and burned, the heater on the tank stopped heating and instead sent electrical shocks everywhere. But mind you, this all happened in the last few days after the hello and the dreams. You could say it's just bad luck and bugs, I know, but... I don't know, it just seems like too much at once for me, and it just doesn't feel right. My dreams, maybe they tried to warn me, and this whole time there is some sort of rhythmic tapping in the ceiling too. No scurrying, AC heaters off, no water damage or anything, but it knocks every hour or so. Sometimes it's short knocking, sometimes it's long, it's not consistent. It's always from the same spot though. Sometimes there's a bang too, but that one happened in different spots, usually above my head. Sometimes I hear knocking at the door and when I go to answer, there's nobody there. I also keep, well, seeing stuff out of the corner of my eyes. No figure, just like a shadow or a light moving across the room. It also feels like large bugs are crawling under my skin sometimes that I'm in the house and it like burns like I'm on fire almost. Although this could be because I'm on such high alert. I don't know. I am really scared, so it could be anxiety, I know that. Anyway, this all happens in a few days, and I left and went to stay at my dad's for a few days because I just couldn't take it anymore. And I felt really good there. But as soon as I came back and stepped foot inside this house, I just feel so much dread. I feel so much better as soon as I step outside, but 
One step inside and my stomach suddenly drops. But what happened to the good vibes the first couple of weeks? It feels so dark and like I'm trapped in here. It used to feel so light and free, but the horrors and the problems, they just never seem to end now. The pest people sprayed after I found the ants, but they found no large issues. They sprayed anyways because I needed it for peace, I guess, but the spiders, they keep coming back and they still haunt me. The hole is still there. The whispers, the dreams, the death of my fish. I love them so much and they find nothing in the attic. I make sure they check it many times. But why does the tapping not end? These days, I sleep with all the lights on in this dreaded house to the sound of that tapping and it just won't stop. I've noticed that it's most often in bouts of nines and sevens and it keeps getting louder as well, I, I swear. I need help, guys. I don't know what I'm dealing with. I don't know what to do. Please, help me. So I moved into a new house about 18 months ago. My special needs cousin and my brother live with me. Three weeks ago, my brother woke up in the middle of the night and decided to sit outside and have a cigarette. He said that he heard the gate open and looked up and the landlord's boyfriend, they live next door, was sneaking into the yard apparently. My brother yelled at him and he tried to act like he wasn't there. My brother got up and the guy ran back to his house. But if this wasn't strange enough, he's been caught four times this week putting his hand through the window and moving the blinds so that he can watch us. I caught him personally a few nights ago standing on a box to peek into my bedroom. I put dead leaves under our window so that we can hear him and it worked. But we caught him sneaking behind our house at about 1am. The next morning at 7am I got a call from the landlord telling me to remove the leaves. They can't see them from their house. You have to be behind my house to see them at all. It's kind of scary and I've been sleeping with my gun and my dog at this point. I feel like if I do anything about this that I'll end up on the streets. It's almost impossible to find another rental where I live at the moment. To be honest, I'm really not sure what to do. We're moving out of this place tomorrow, I think. But I think we're about to move out of this place tomorrow because I left the house for 20 minutes today and somebody had definitely broken in. As of right now, I, I feel like I have only two choices. Shoot the man or leave in the morning. I'm purchasing an RV tomorrow so that I have somewhere to stay temporarily. I have a little bit of money saved and my boss is helping with the rest. All I can say is that I'm thankful for the people in my life's help. After I get all of my stuff out, I'm going to talk to the police and the property manager. Hopefully she won't help them rent this to anyone else. I doubt the police will do much though since, well, I don't really have much proof. But anyways, here's to moving on. This happened a few years ago when I was working at a hospital. I was taking my lunch break and wanted to have some alone time in my car. I was an assistant who sat at the front desk all day so I needed time to myself for relaxing. And after getting lunch in our cafeteria, I start walking outside to go to my car. I walk out one of the main entrances that's across from our behavioral health facility. I see this lady who... I assume was a patient as she was in green scrubs and was holding a brown paper sack and just sort of standing around the entrance. She didn't look like medical staff and had blood on her scrubs as well. I also made the assumption that she may have been discharged from behavioral health or something. Anyway, as I walk past her she shouts at me, hey ma'am can I get a ride? And I stopped to look at her and shook my head and said no sorry. I felt guilty as she probably didn't have anyone to call herself, but she quickly replied very offended, why? Which that to me meant that it wasn't a good idea to engage and she probably would have been really angry at any excuse that I gave her. So I turned away and I just kept walking to my car. Once I get into my car, I lock the doors and turn it on to listen to some music. As soon as I start to eat my food, the lady in the green scrubs appears at my driver's side door and is yelling at me and knocking on the window. 
I don't know what she's saying as I'm pretty startled and looking at her in disbelief. The parking lot that I was in was pretty huge as this held most of the staff who worked at the hospital. So I was pretty shocked to know that she had been following me the whole time without me noticing. And it's also really weird that she felt the need to follow me without shouting more at me or to get my attention or anything. I was too stunned to say anything to her but she suddenly went to the back passenger door and tried to open it. I see that she can't actually open the door because I locked them when I got inside. But seeing this, I quickly grabbed my phone and dialed 911. I was shaking, I had no idea what this lady was capable of or if she was going to leave at all. But the fact that she was trying to open my car door to force me to give her a ride? I don't know what I would have done if she actually got in there, but I think my fight or flight mode would have kicked in and I would have had to physically remove her myself if I felt threatened. In any case, as soon as dispatch answers my phone call, the lady was slowly walking away from my car and then I didn't see her at all. Now, our hospital has its own sort of like police department, so when I told dispatch where I was, she transferred me to the hospital PD. I tell them what happened, what the lady looked like, what parking lot I was in, and they asked if I felt safe to walk back to work and that an officer would escort me, but I declined. I kind of felt silly for feeling that afraid and I didn't want to seem weak by needing the police to walk me back. I wait in the car for a few minutes and see our PD circling the lot a few times. I assumed that she was never found because I didn't see where she walked off to and I never saw police stopped anywhere talking to anyone that may have been the lady or anything. I was shaking during my whole lunch break and didn't feel like eating anymore. Nothing like that had happened to me before and I'm always paranoid when a stranger walks up to me and asks for like help or money or anything. I always want to help but my gut always tells me that it's just never really a good idea. I could have told her that there were phones inside the hospital she could use to call someone for a ride I suppose but knowing what happened later that probably wouldn't have helped. And I had seen that she was talking to other people outside before I walked past her at the entrance, so she had been asking many people, I assume. I feel bad as she probably has some sort of mental health issues or something, but I know it doesn't excuse her behavior. I didn't tell anyone when I got back to work either. I just wanted to move on with my day like it never happened. I didn't want anyone to make a fuss over it. Thankfully, nothing else has happened like that again, and I always walk with purpose when I'm leaving or going to my car these days and having pepper spray helps a little too. I'm really glad that I have the habit of immediately locking my doors once I'm inside my car though because honestly who knows what could have happened if I hadn't have locked the doors that day. So I'm female, 31, states away from house on a business trip. About an hour ago, around 8.30pm here, I had just gotten back to my room from a work dinner. And I heard shuffling in the hallway, peeked out the peephole. I saw a figure seemingly outside the room to the left of mine, looking outwards. They were knocking lightly and said twice, quickly, hello. Then it sounded like the door opened and closed. I was like... Huh, okay, they must have forgotten what room they were in or something and someone let them in. I walk back to the main part of my room and I hear shuffling again. I look out and see a figure. Can't really make out what the person looks like, but I see them on the other side of my room this time and again I hear light knocking and hello. Now, I'm starting to get a weird spidery sense of like, what the heck is going on? I see the figure leave and think, okay, that was weird. Then I again start hearing shuffling. I start walking toward the hotel room door and hear a light knock on what sounds to be my door, I think. And again I hear, hello, hello. And immediately after this, someone attempts to open my door. Thank God I had the cross latch pulled over, not the deadbolt though. My heart stopped as I stood there and watched the door hit the latch and fall back shut. I called the front desk and informed them that someone had just tried entering my room and I'm not staying with anyone. The front desk attendant just replied, I don't have any housekeeping up there. To which I replied, okay, well that's concerning. Can you please send someone up to check around? 
The attendant replied that there was no manager on duty, to which I asked if I could call the police instead because I was very worried as I started to cry a bit. She replied that I should do what I thought I needed to do and I hung up and cried for a bit, not sure what to do. I didn't want to ask for another room because I was too scared to leave now. But 10 minutes later, the hotel phone starts ringing. I was honestly feeling really scared to answer, but I did. It was the front desk attendant, and she said the police were going to be coming to my room, and she didn't want me to panic when I heard someone knock on the door. I said okay, and I hung up. I sat there and thought, how do I know that this is actually legit? Whoever tried to access my room had a key. Otherwise, how else would the door have actually opened? A few minutes later, as expected, I hear a knock. I looked out the peephole and saw two male officers. I didn't ask to see ID, which in hindsight, it probably would have been the smart thing to do, but I was so shaken up and not really thinking straight. I opened the door and they asked what was going on and so I told them all that I explained earlier. They said it was good that I had the cross latch pulled over because the door would have opened if not and I responded that it's a hotel, what do you mean? What's the point of the access card then? And we wiggled the handle. We were in the hallway talking with my door open. Then they took a pause and they were like, oh, it automatically locks? Again, I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, it's a hotel. So then they had me shut the door and open it with a key to test it. Sure enough, it didn't open without the access card. Then they said it was probably housekeeping. I responded that the front desk attendant told me that there was no housekeeping up here when I called. Plus, it was like 8.30pm. Why would housekeeping be coming by that time unless I'd requested someone to come by? Plus, I noticed housekeeping had already been by during the day because my trash was emptied and the dirty towel was gone. They ultimately told me that they thought that it was housekeeping and not to worry, but if anything else happened or I felt unsafe, then I should call them. They also said that if I wanted to change rooms that they were sure the hotel would accommodate this. I said okay while crying and they left. And now I'm sitting in my room crying, laying under the covers in my clothes. I'm sure that I won't be sleeping tonight. I'm also too afraid to change rooms because I don't want to leave this room now. I have the cross latch pulled over and the deadbolt locked. I think that I'm safe. Am I being paranoid? I don't know. Was it housekeeping? Should I do something different? I don't know what that was, but all I know is that I can't wait for this to be over. So there was a house in my hometown that I've always been fascinated with since I was a young child. It was on a main road and whenever I rode by it, I would try to imagine what it was like living in that house. And I had a clear picture in my mind of what it was like inside. In late 2019, my husband and I were on our way to visit my sister, and along the way we see that house that I loved from my childhood was listed for sale. We were renting and happy, but something told me that we should buy that house. I looked it up on Redfin and calculated that the mortgage would actually cost less than our rent, and it was recently renovated, so there shouldn't be many upfront costs. We found a realtor, toured the house, put an offer in, and it was accepted in 24 hours. Our offer was accepted in March of 2020, right before the housing market exploded and property values went through the roof. The seller was very eager to work with us and correct every single thing that came up in the inspection, and even corrected some things that we didn't ask for. In fact, she went way above and beyond to make sure that we didn't back out. In any case, we moved in and we quickly discover that the house is really, like, haunted. Never anything sinister, but something in the house definitely wants us to know that it's there and it likes things a certain way. The details could be an entirely different post, but two previous homeowners have confirmed that they've experienced paranormal activity there too. A person who lived in the house in the 90s actually stopped by to talk about it when he was in town visiting. The thing that concerns me is that these folks have experienced things that were much more sinister than we have. I think the creepy details here are that the house's layout and style are exactly as I envisioned them as a kid too. It sounds silly, I know, but I used to draw the layout in the sand when I played house as a little kid. 
and I even tried to recreate the house in The Sims when I was in high school. The other creepy thing though is, well, the dreams. You see, as we were closing, my husband and I had some insanely vivid dreams about the house and its occupants. Again, nothing sinister or scary, I guess, but definitely weird. Notable history of the house too is that it was built by a local mason in 1928 as a retirement cottage for him and his wife. It was their dream home and the descendants of his family are still in the area and have asked to come over and see it. They have a real attachment to the house too. Apparently somebody ended their own life in there in 2002. The second night that we slept in the house, a blade from the ceiling fan in our bedroom became detached and flew across the room. The fan is apparently mounted where the light fixture that this man ended his own life with was located. There were reports of paranormal activity before this and this man had a, a gambling problem, I, I believe. They got a foreclosure notice and his wife filed for divorce in the month before, well, everything went down, so I really don't believe that it was related to the paranormal activity, but who knows. I guess what I'm wondering though is, why do I have such a connection to this house? And how likely is whatever is here to be as benign as it appears to my husband and me? I still love this house and have no desires to leave, but I also am aware that a ceiling fan blade flying across the room like that and almost hitting one of us is not your average haunting. When I was about four or five, I was at my grandmother's home, several stories from there, and it was a rainy spring day. I remember playing in the living room since I couldn't go out, but the front door was open, but the screen glass exterior door was closed still. At some point, I noticed an old man dressed in a black suit, a white shirt, large brim black hat, standing at the end of the walk facing the door, about 30 feet out. I remember he seemed sort of out of place at the time and it sort of struck me, even at a young age, as being sort of, well, disturbing I guess. I ran to get my grandma because everything about it scared me and she sensed the terror and ran back to the front door area with me. When I looked back down the end of the walk, the man was nowhere to be seen. But chills ran down my spine as my grandmother placed a hand on my shoulder, proceeded to back up slowly and started yelling, you get out of here. When I looked up at her, she had a glare in her eyes, locked on the door and repeatedly yelled, get out of here while pulling me back. I then looked at the upper half of the door where she was pointing and saw the old man standing what would have been inches from the glass portion upper half of the door, but I had just been inches from the lower half screen and saw nothing. He only appeared in the upper half of the door if that makes sense and my grandmother backed us up to the hallway and when we got there she turned quickly and darted us off to the kitchen. I remember this so clearly too. There were many other experiences in that home but that one definitely stands out and has stuck with me my entire life. This happened when I was like four or five, a few days or weeks after Easter. You see, that year I had eaten an awful lot of chocolate and ultimately, well, I was pretty blocked up. This led to me being kind of disgusted by it, I suppose, to the point that I had officially declared that I hated chocolate. And this, believe it or not, was actually what saved my life, I think. That day, my parents and I were walking down the avenue and I asked my parents if I could run and they said yes. The man who probably thought that I was alone decided to approach me. I don't know how accurate my memories are, but I definitely recall him being extremely close to my face. He offered me a chocolate bar with the creepiest grin ever and I politely declined and argued that I didn't like chocolate anymore. I remember being really calm and not really scared much. I I was just a toddler, so I don't think I realized what was happening. My parents immediately intervened, though, and scared this guy away. They told me that I'd done a great job refusing that man's offer because, well, maybe he could have poisoned it, or worse. And I think this is what really scared me at the time. I still love chocolate these days, but I thank God almost every day that back then I didn't. My 
My mum's dog, Punky, rest in peace, was a very sweet and loving dog. She was an ESA dog, but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never really seen her get aggressive with anyone in, like, the entire 12 years that she lived. She never growled or even nipped at anyone, and she had no sense of smell, so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terrier at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here is that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I really only ever saw it once. So I, an 11-year-old female, was at home with my siblings, two male and six female. My then stepdad is at work and my mum ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a two-bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, not a dead-end road at the time, and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down a, a rickety driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer having a grand time watching YouTube videos, I think, when all of a sudden, all of our dogs, about two Boston Terriers and one Chihuahua, perk up, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figure that they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur standing on end, her tail straight up, and then she barks. Loudly, too. I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off the couch and goes tearing down the hallway... I'm already on edge because I don't think that I've heard her bark like this, like, ever. Her bark is more of a baying sound, I guess, because of her breed and everything, but this was a big, loud, and alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it. Three knocks. We never really got visitors because of how weird our house was, location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up were family, and they never knocked. So I, I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the attention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky. And I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were all the size of the New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a little bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man that I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly too. He was really thin, taller man, with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes and his half-manged hair. Sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin as well. A little too shallow and his clothes were all off too. They were nice, I guess, but fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer-looking t-shirt and new jeans, but he had what looked like a suit jacket on or something. All his clothes were dark, too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up or taped over, maybe? In any case, I stare up at him in confusion because... I definitely don't know this man, and I ask what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that was just way too fake, like this exaggerated and really forced grin, and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do, like, hey there kiddo, I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner, and he shakes the bottle at me, mind if I come to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head, obviously, because he just seems so... off... Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is really unnerving, because he probably knew that they weren't, and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, I know that, that I'd have to go and get my mum, something like that, except for what I did say. Instead, I just shook my head and said, no, we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things. And he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out at this point and I think to close the door, but 
The thing is, is that our front door didn't really, well, lock. It was a small town, hard to access home. We never really needed a lock, to be honest. So that was basically useless. And I'm sure that there's something very wrong about to happen. And I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think that I have before it does happen. When all of a sudden, I hear it. Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground, and her teeth bared and snarling like she was absolutely feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth, her eyes were down, and she was ready to pounce. The guy, he hears it too, and as I look towards Punky, she tries to lunge past me, and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word. He booked it down the driveway as I let Pinky out along with the rest of our dogs and they start chasing this guy. Our small dogs, they chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about. But Punky, uh, Punky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just sort of staring in the distance until he finally disappears. To this day, I swear that I saw someone join up with him running when he got onto the road. The second that he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog that I knew. No barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realized that my siblings are still down and call to run to check on them and when I get to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still. But it was then that I noticed that the bedroom window was wide open. The curtains pushed all to one side and the items on the dresser in the front of the window all shoved around. Someone had definitely been trying to climb through the window, no doubt in my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch where Punky was sleeping, so I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off. And the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mum inside while our dogs were the ones that saw public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, obviously, but... After my mum got home, she took us all to my aunt's house and on our way, we saw the men walking up somebody else's driveway. Men, plural as well. We watched a second one split off to wait by the road. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old, but even now as an adult in my 30s, I remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had taken my sister and I out to a, a movie, and then to get some ice cream in celebration of my older sister getting straight A's on her report card. I remember my dad had gotten off work later than usual, so by the time the movie was over and we had our ice cream, it was well past our bedtime. It didn't matter though. My parents were happy and proud of my sister. We had a great time and we took our time getting home as well. If it wasn't for what happened when we got there, I would have always looked back fondly on this night. We got home at around 10.30. Bedtime was usually 10, so I went straight to my mum to put my pajamas on while my sister went to brush her teeth. I remember too thinking that it seemed a little bit more chilly in the house that night. But that's really the only thing out of the ordinary that I can recall from when we first walked in. I barely had a chance to change too when I heard my dad yell our names from what I thought was the kitchen. I didn't know what was wrong but I knew that it was bad because I heard the fear in his voice for the first time ever. It scared me really badly so I bolted out the door and into the kitchen as fast as I could. My sister was already there and her and my parents were standing very close my mum looked like she was on the verge of panic and she motioned for me to come close. She wrapped her arms around my sister and I and my dad was already dialing on the house phone. Then I noticed some glass on the floor. I asked what was wrong mum but she didn't want to tell me. She said that we needed to go outside right away. As we headed out the front door I heard my dad talking to 911, an operator, and telling them that when we got home we found our backsliding glass door shattered and objects strewn throughout the kitchen. 
We went to the neighbor's house and waited for the police to come. After a few minutes, my dad joined us. He seemed to be well shaken up, which was a new sight to me, to be honest. But the police arrived and searched the house extensively. It was a big scene with all of our neighbors outside, flashing lights illuminating our entire street for like hours. They never found anybody in the house. Whoever had been there had come and gone. But the thing that really gets me is that nothing was ever stolen. Whoever it was didn't want any of our possessions. What they did was take our canned food out of the pantry and stack them into like small pyramids in our kitchen counter. They also turned on the TV in the basement and moved a few random objects to different parts of the house. Which was really creepy looking back on it. It was like an insane person had been in our home and did things for reasons that really only made sense to him. Anyway, as the police were finishing up and ready to leave... I heard one of them ask my mum a question. They talked quietly and I'm sure that they thought that I didn't hear it. I pretended not to be listening but I heard everything. And well, you see, we keep magnetized letters on our fridge. I think I had gotten them for a birthday present a few years before or something. And we use them to leave each other messages for fun sometimes. The cop was asking my mum if the message on there that night was done by any of us. And it wasn't. And I watched my mum turn pale when he told her what it said. It still makes my skin crawl to this very day because it said, always watching. The police, they never did find any fingerprints. They said the intruder must have been wearing gloves. And for the next few days, the entire family was extremely uneasy. I was absolutely positive that the intruder was still in the house somehow, that there was a hidden place nobody knew about where he could hide and listen to us. I never really shook the feeling that somebody was there, and within a few months we ended up deciding to move. It was all just too scary for us to stay in that area, so we moved to a house several miles away. Thankfully, we were never bothered again, but I still do think about it. Was it kids just playing a prank? Was it some insane person that wanted to torment a random family? Or was it someone that truly had it out for us and who really was always watching? Could it have been a neighbor or someone that we knew? These questions still keep me up at night sometimes. This obviously happened many years ago, but the hairs on my neck stand up sometimes when I'm alone at home and I have to check the house to make sure that no one is hiding in it. It must have been about 4.45 in the afternoon. My aunt was home alone since my parents were at work and I was on my way home. She heard a knock at the door and went to answer it when the dogs continued barking, meaning that it wasn't a quick delivery or something like that. And she was met with three Caucasian young adult men. They were all wearing black matching uniforms, though we don't know if they were actually uniforms or not, I guess. They came in a white van with blue letters on it. English isn't her first language, so it was hard for her to understand what they were saying because they talked too fast for her. But she did understand when they asked for me by name. She told them that I wasn't and they immediately left. They didn't leave a message for me or a note or a business card or anything. When I got home shortly after, she told me that some people had been looking for me. They weren't family, obviously, or she would have known them, and they weren't friends of mine. They don't sound like any religious group I've ever heard of before, or they didn't go to our neighbor's houses or anything, too. They came to our house specifically, and they knew me by my first name as well. I'm worried about them coming back again, and my aunt doesn't live with us. Usually I would be the one home alone at that hour and I'm curious as to who they were and what they wanted with me. But I'm also scared to think of how it would have gone if I had actually opened the door instead. I've dealt with the paranormal side ever since I can remember. But this... This is the story that happened in Mount Juliet, Tien. 
My wife and I moved in sometime in September of 2014. We bought the home at auction and it needed a lot of work. The home was built in 1969 and it was all original to that date, even down to the shag carpet still being there. But the house sat on 12 acres though, with only 3 acres cleared around the home, other than some random trees, but the rest was fully wooded. The basement? Man, the basement was gross and musty. The ceilings were low in places with the pipes and duct working running throughout it. And I have to admit that it had a, a really odd sort of strange feeling when walking down there. The previous owners left a deep freezer down there and what they had inside of it made me question the things that they were doing in that basement. The freezer was full of different animal carcasses that had been stripped of meat. Random bone pieces with bits of fur still attached. There was also a gallon bucket sitting in there full of blood. Our very first night staying there, my brother and sister decided to stay over with us. Well, we're all hanging out anyway and it got late so they just decided to stay. And while we were there, we were unpacking boxes and decorating for Halloween and whatnot. I started walking the empty boxes and totes down to the basement. And while down there, something caught my eye. I saw what looked like a slim box sitting on top of the ductwork. I walked over and pulled the box down and sure enough it was an old 70s Ouija board. Not thinking too much about it, I, I grabbed it and brought it upstairs and sat it on our dining room hutch for decoration. The night was getting late though and we're all getting tired. It had to have been around midnight and we decided to head up to the second floor and get some sleep. All the bedrooms were dispersed on the second floor. My wife and I took the master bedroom and my brother and sister took rooms of their own. We laid there trying to doze off when suddenly we heard what sounded like closet doors sliding and slamming shut and the sound of running and stomping back and forth in the hallway. My wife had me get up to tell my brother and sister to stop that before we were trying to get to sleep. I get up and go to each of their rooms and ask, what are you guys doing? We're trying to sleep and in their words, they said, I thought that that was you guys. I decided to grab my gun at this point, thinking that maybe someone had broken into the house or something. I slowly walked downstairs, clearing each room as I went along. My wife, brother and sister followed behind with a gun of their own. We cleared every room that there was in that house. And suddenly it dawned on my sister, it's the Ouija board. I quickly grabbed it from the hutch cabinet and took it back to the basement and after that it was silent for the rest of the night. Now as time went on whatever this thing was it was making itself known. We would have to block the basement door shut because we were constantly finding it open. Anytime we had to go down into the basement we would always feel something down there and it was demonic for a, a lack of a better term. We would hear it walking up to the second floor, walking around the bedrooms. Doors would suddenly slam shut. The lights would surge randomly. I began seeing a dark shadow figure and it wasn't just any well, spirit. Whatever it was, it was completely dark. Like I said, it felt demonic. I felt like I was losing my mind at one point too. Voices were constantly in my head. Sometimes there were whispers, other times they were louder but always sounded sort of muffled. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying but it was all the time and the only time the voices weren't in my head was when I wasn't really home. We also had chickens and sheep that died for no reason. All of our vehicles constantly had problems, including my mower. And one day, as I was putting laundry away... I had the windows open to catch a summer breeze because our HVAC didn't work very well and I heard the strangest sound. So I looked out the window and listened and it was coming from the right side of the house inside the woods. It got closer and closer and that was when I saw it. This thing is the only way that I can describe it was a werewolf of sorts but walking throughout our front yard and disappeared into the woods on the other side I was really just in shock seeing it I really didn't know what to make of it but 
it looked like a, a humanoid wolf is the only way that I can describe it. Just walking across the field out there. One random night too, we were watching a movie and the lights surged and we heard the basement door slowly opening. I jumped up and wedged the door shut with a chair like I always do. Another night, I walked past the basement door to find it open, no lights on, and I hear my wife down there calling my name. I thought that it was strange that she was down there, so I didn't walk down there. I then heard walking above me. I slowly walk upstairs to the second floor. I make my way up the stairs and turn the corner to find my wife in our room. I told her how I heard her voice calling my name from the basement, and to this day, I wonder, what did I actually hear, and if it wasn't my wife, then what did it want me down in the basement for? The presence continued, and it was making us feel on edge. Tired, because I was hardly sleeping now, I tossed and turned, and the voices grew louder and louder, yet... I could never really make out what they were saying. After a few years, we decided that enough was enough and we put the house up for sale. But my father-in-law was over helping work on a few things before the house hit the market. And while he was there, doors slammed shut and the voices started to enter his mind apparently as well. He even said that he could make out what they were saying and eventually we moved out and after that... There was just nothing. 